à 300 000. On a du
trois prototypes peuvent échapper. Les trois prototypes peuvent échapper. Good afternoon and welcome to Sunday, the final day of Le Mans Classic 2023. It's John Hindor, Peter Snowden and Andrew Marriott with you for a 43-minute contest. Uh, is the third race of our fourth grid in the, tracing the history of the 100 years of the Le Mans 24 hours, the Grand Prix d'Endurance. Uh, another short, another short uh, chronological split here, Peter. 1962 to 1965, uh, stars and stripes. Potentially our shortest one, isn't it? I, I think it is, it is yeah. yeah. Three years and four years, I think, are the two yeah. shortest ones we've had. And uh, this one, I mean, this is... Uh, effectively, we are children of this era. I was born in 1962. Baby well, boomers. Yes, we. Uh, the Porsche 911 was born in 1963. Uh, these are the cars that we grew up idolising because in our formative years, many of these cars were still running, particularly, I think, of of the Sunbeam Tiger. I remember seeing a Sunbeam Alpine uh, on the streets in Sunderland, probably about 1967 or 1968. And it was an early one, so it had the big fins still on the back. Yes. Not, not like the Mark IV that turned it, not, turned it down a wee bit. And that, that looked impossibly exotic yes to they, me what they, they did do didn't mm. they it's just but uh, yeah we, we mentioned uh, uh, earlier didn't we about the the 50s being quite a much of this sort of i said it was the english here at the morning if you like this one's named stars and stripes it's the the american time the swing in 60s yeah when it was uh, we'd got past that post-war but and there was uh, who was the english politician that said we never had it uh, so good uh, harold mcmillan harold mcmillan it was wasn't it um and it was that time where everything we'd got over that austerity of the 50s, what the, the grey drab 50s, as it was, because not only was there no no colour television much at that time, but there was a colour film. But everything seemed to be in black and white. All of a sudden, 60s is the colour, isn't it? And you know, in in the UK, people forget that we had uh, rationing still, yeah. uh, well after many years after the war, and that optimism of of the 19. 50s gave way to an explosion of excitement in 19 in the 1960s the, the, the sexual revolution of course uh, uh, as well as a difference flower in power and all that it, music it, it, it was kind of the payback for the work the hard yards put in in the 50s wasn't it that's yeah. where they reaped it that's that's for the benefits right We've done all that now. Right, now let's crack on. We're going to go God. bonkers for a decade. And this is the first part of that 1960s decade. So cars like the Ford GT 40, right in the middle uh, of the 60s, and the, some of the youngest cars we've got. Jaguar E-Types, still uh, uh, beautiful cars uh, at this uh, stage of their development. MGBs, bringing some of that... Jaguar uh, exotic styling to a, a slightly different marketplace. Uh, the birth of the Porsche 911, so we've got some 911s here. Still got some more exotics, the Ferraris uh, and the Alfa Romeos. There's a Julia TZ in here that I'm very, look, very much very, looking very, very to. Very, very exotic. I mean, he Healy's were, my father often referred oh. to a Healy as, and bear in mind, he had two of them in period. In fact, the very first car I came, I went to, went in when I came home from hospital was a Healy 106. Oh, so wow. there you go. But my father always said it was known as the poor man's Aston. Yeah, that's what it was at yeah. the time. Yeah. He obviously aspired to that and ended up buying Astons. Also, did, also but. coming through, of course, we have the age of the American pony cars, of which the Ford Mustang, um, probably the most well known outside of the states, at least. Yes, of course, we had. Uh, Corvette was coming along, although not strictly speaking in a pony car, but we had the GM variants as well uh, of their uh, big 
V8 engine cars, but the Ford Mustang caught people's attention. Well, it did, and, and it came out initially, didn't it, as a as a six-cylinder car. Yeah, then absolutely. they said put a V8 in it, and uh, it, at the point that time they, they couldn't make enough of them. That's right. It was simple as that. They could not make enough of them to to meet sales demand. Uh, it was so clamoured for at the time. Beautiful cars as well, and of course that that evolved. Then, of course, you, then you get the whole different philosophy of the American cars, much bigger because the, the space and natural size of the country they can have bigger cars compared to our European cars. Put a big V8 in it, and then of course you get that perfect harmony of somebody like Carroll Shelby and others, but he's probably the most preeminent, taking the beautiful AC8, which had a Bristol engine in most of the time, one of the prettiest, exquisite little British sports cars of the time, and saying. I know, why don't we, why don't we build our own car? You've built a car there for us, a bit like we had in the 50s still. Get your chassis, we're going to put our big engine in that and, and f stretch the arches a bit and just, just pump it up a little bit. And now comes to that, the AC Cobra, as I will say it, and you will say it differently. I'll say Cobra if you're Correct. Sick. No, not at all, no. I don't need to, it's fine. It's fine. But that's, that put that muscle car into the sweet little British handling chassis. And of course, that then evolves before you know it. You've got American uh, Shelby, American Racing Corporation, building the GT40s and making, making them the car it was. It was a Lola design originally, yep, but it, it, did, it didn't work. And it took it took Carol Shelby and co to make that car the success it became. You know? The same concept going for the Sunbeam Tiger, which had been the 1500 originally, the three bearing car, and then the five bearing. 1725, the old Humber Scepter uh, engine, and turning that into the Sunbeam uh, Tiger. And that, I remember talking to Carol Shelby here at Le Mans about that. I interviewed him and Phil Hill a few years ago on Radio Le Mans, and he's saying that car had immense potential. But of course, what happened was that the UK part of the business, the Roots Group, Brian Roots, was still at the head of it at that time. Was taken over by Chrysler in the States, and Chrysler in the States didn't like their European Halo sports car uh, being run with a Ford engine. And there was a prototype built to put the Chrysler Hemi in the Sunbeam Alpine in the Tiger. It was just slightly too much work, a bit more hammering around the, the scuttle paddle, I think that made it a little bit too difficult and sadly after the uh, Mark V's and the second of the Tigers, the second uh, iteration of the Tigers, the car disappeared. Only 1725, loved that car. Andrew Marriott is with us. How's, what's the state of play for Plateau 4 then as we're about to get underway for their final run? Yeah, well, I've just been down in the marshalling area, John, that we saw the pictures from and uh, got the full SP or some of the SP on what's been happening. Um, it's the uh, young German driver who uh, finished uh, second uh, last year, Breitmeier, who um, is currently fastest and uh, will lead the group um, from the guy who won it last year, who is Ferral, the uh, Portuguese driver, and I have to do the sums yet. So that's that's uh, Emil Breitmeier, the Emil, Belgian, yeah, the young guy, young guy. Belgian uh, in yeah. the GT40 number 38. From uh, who did you see? The number 74 car. Yeah, the, the two that finished first and second last year overall. And that's uh, uh, Diogo uh, Ferral, uh, Portuguese yeah. Yeah. in the 74, both in GT40s from 1965. Indeed, the top six qualifiers uh, are uh, from uh, top seven, actually. Top eight? No, top no. nine. No. All from it's, it's, it, is, sorry, it is Ferral who is in the lead on the aggregate uh, and the second race of the night by the way they finished side by side oh did they yeah and um but in the first race uh, yesterday afternoon or, or yesterday evening after we went off the air uh Farrell had six seconds on uh, breitmeyer but that race was run by gleisel and uh, and seb perez but i think they may not they may have then hit a problem see running on the front row of the grid, the Farley, Jim Farley, that is, you'll talk about him in a second, and Eric van der Poelen car. In the night, they had the door come off when Jim Farley was driving. It's not the first time a door's come off a GT40. That was just as we were leaving last yeah. night. I heard yeah. that on yeah. the event radio. Yeah. I the, heard the uh, interview. The door came off, and the, the, so that, that 
didn't finish that race. But Van der Poel is in the car now. And uh, it'll be interesting to see um, what he can do. Obviously, a driver with huge Le Mans experience. Again, uh, a bit like Kellen, as we were speaking about, Ralph Kellen. Driven for lots of the factories here, including, of course, Bentley. He was one of the Bentley, latter-day Bentley boys, as Eric van der Poel. But uh, I've spent a lot of time racing for Nissan as well. Jim Farley uh, dedicated the door falling off to, who was it? Who he likened oh, yeah. it to. Uh, when I heard the interview last night, um, ex, ex, he's such a petrol head. Jim Farley is the man who sits behind the big desk, behind the, yeah. in the big glass tower that says Ford on it, the big blue oval. He's a, a more than capable racer. He's uh, raced himself in uh, GT4 uh, in the US in a number of VP racing fuel oh. events, including at Daytona, uh, the inaugural VP uh, racing challenge event with shorts or has LMP3s in. So that's a John, two category race. Here last year, he put it on the pole. He was the fastest guy in qualifying in his GT40. He was on his own that year. He's got Eric van der Poel. He's raced at the uh, Spa six hours with van der Poel um, on a number of occasions. Now, he said the track temperature would rise. Air temperature just about 20 Celsius at the moment, maybe going a little higher this afternoon. But the track temperature now having doubled since this morning. It is 31 Celsius on the tarmac. Uh, and that is pretty toasty. Give it another three or four degrees. Now, this is all going to be down to the tyre pressures as well, of course, and understanding where you start with the tyre pressures. At RSL Studio, if you want to get in touch with us, thank you for all your comments, suggestions, uh, and also statistical facts that you've been firing into us. It is a bit of a GT40 fest here, uh, but let's talk about some of the other cars. A couple of Shelby Cobra Daytona Coupes, or Coupes, uh, that are up there as well. The number 59, the best of them. That's uh, Olivier Gallon. Um, Olivier Knight, uh, in fact, in, if that was an English name. Tenth position for him. We've got Erwin France in the number 70 car. Uh, and he heads three, Urzbeck and Charles Fermanich. Uh, Ludo Caron is next up in another GT40. 16th, Ollie Bryant in a 904 six-cylinder Carrera GTS from 1965. That's a Porsche, of course. Uh, that car leads its category. Also on Paul in class, Armand Mille for the Jaguar E-Type from 1963, start of this little period of 3.8, number 35. Also, uh, Dirk Ebeling in the Bitzerini 5300 GT, 5.3 engine car, that leads its class. Bitzerini, interesting manufacturer and a mark that some people, Andrew, might not know. What's the history of that one? Well, there are, basically, it's an ESO Griffo. Bitzerini were, were a, a, a bodybuilder who put a, a more racier, racy body on it, and they did race uh, the Bitzerinis here. Uh, if I remember right, there was a big Chevrolet motor in it. Yeah, well, 5.3 would suggest yeah. uh, that being... The case, other class leaders, Guillaume Brejeur in the Lotus Elan 26R. 26R, the Lotus Elan, that's the holy grail, isn't it, if you're oh, in a land man? John, John, I, I'm involved with the Lotus, racing Lotus Elan, which is very quick, actually, run by, raced by a guy called Giles Dawson, who runs the ATL fuel cells business. We had a, we had a win at Brands the other day, and tried to get into this, and we're one of the people that didn't get in. One of the 300, as we yeah, were yeah. hearing. Yeah. 43 minutes on the clock. Stand by for the final action of the 2023 Le Mans Classic weekend for the cars from 1962 to 1965. This is the Stars and Stripes grid. Plateau 4, the fourth of our six little slices of time through the 100-year history of the Le Mans 24 hours. And it's a fine sight to see these mostly Grand Touring cars out there. So coupes, two-door coupes, fastbacks, some mid-engine, some front-engine, and of course, we've got Porsches, so rear-engine. We've got the full complement here. And when the red lights go out, we'll be racing, which we are now. And across the line, the countdown starts. The I don't, I don't know what the collective now for GT40s are. Uh, broadly, of GT40s. Broadly, of GT40, brilliant. Uh, including brilliant. an open top car. Yeah, that's, right, that's, that's the Roadster from 1965, the Macedo uh, Silvia. 
car. Yeah, they had a good fifth last night, but I didn't see who was in the Glacial Perez car, whether it was young Seb Perez or whether it was Glacial. Uh, we might be able to pick out the crash helmet. So down through the Forest S's for the first time. And the car straw. This is if you if you have watched recently uh, Ford, Ford versus Ferrari Le Mans 1966, uh, you will be reveling in the 1964-1965 cars at the head of this field. The Peter Klute number three car is a 64 car. The rest are all 1965s, including that very unusual roller, the Rui Macedo, uh, Macedo Silva number 73 car, the light green car towards the back of the leading group. First two then, coming down to the Daytona chicane. Right, left, right. And the dark coloured number one is James Farley. Jim Farley from uh, Ford Motor Company. Van der Poel is in the car at the It's moment. Van der Poel, right, fantastic. Behind him is Christian. It's listed as Christian Glassel in the car, in the red and gold car. The twin stripes, very much the fashion. Yeah, they, they won the first race uh, yesterday. Uh, but had problems in the second. Andrew Marriott, John Heindorf for this one. Side, side by, by side. side into the second chicane. And here comes the red and gold car, the pole sitting number 44. That's the Glasel car. Goes yeah. through. These cars are uh, similar, uh, exactly similar. Look a little bit different with, I, I always think that black yeah. painted front end. Uh, on the on the white car does make it look a lot more chisel fronted, but they are exactly the same bodywork on the front. Through has come Emil Britmeyer in the dark blue, uh, uh, coming through now. No, that's the uh, number one car. That's Jim Farley. Excuse me, coming through. Oh, Britmeyer, er Eric the, Vanderpool. Yeah, uh, Eric Vanderpool. In yeah. Jim Farley's car. Yeah. Um, is that his car? Is uh, it or is it uh, on loan from uh, FMC? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Uh, of course, we've got Lynn, father and son, in uh, what's. Six or seven trays actually just been. Oh, one of the what the Lynn car has just hit problems and dropped back. Yeah, two Lynn cars here, the one oh, and the five. Yeah, we've got, uh, got down, down down to the bottom end of the circuit and heading towards Indianapolis and Arnage, and it is the number one car. Eric van der Poel turns into the right-handed first part of Indianapolis. And Marshall's post 13, halfway down the Mulsanne straight in between them, has claimed the number 19 car. That car is going no further at the moment. Uh, that being the Marcos 1800. That's the Chris Marsh and Nick Strong car. Yeah. Chris, owner, uh, son it's of, of the founder, Jeff of the Marsh. Founder. Yeah. yeah, two litre inline four engine in that car, but the two leaders are streaking away from the rest of the field, coming to the Porsche are. curves for the first time and breaking very early. Van der Poel are just settling the black number one on its suspension with the 44 sitting in second position. Yeah, we're uh, revisiting last year's race where these were the two top runners. This was a cracking race yep. last year. Yep, and uh, just note the number one car's got the little Dan Gurney blister in the roof. Of course, obviously, GT40, 40 inches high, very low roof line. Some of the taller drivers had to have the blister. Just yeah. see it there in I, our picture. I think Jim might have uh, been mentioning Gurney last night with the door off that car. Side by side into the braking area for, appropriately enough, the Ford chicane that was uh, added uh, to slow the cars down as they'd come yeah. through White House in those days, but it's still... GT40 number one from GT40 number 44. I think it's Britmeyer, Emil Britmeyer, who's come through into third. We'll check them as they go across the line. In the sunshine, sun pretty much at its zenith now. And the temperature rising all the time here at Le Mans 2023 for the 11th running of the Classic. Problems down at Arnage last time around. Well, very nearly a side swipe of the Mustang onto the e type there. Yeah, the um, the guy currently in third place, Diogo, the uh, Portuguese. Right. Actually, he runs the uh, the historic festival Algarve. He's raced Aston Martin GT4s, Lola T292, and Alain. He's had a lot of success. So the lead battle continues. We're going to find it difficult to take 
our eyes away from this one because they are tremendously entertaining. These cars, when driven on the limit, yes, we were getting into the area of aerodynamics at this stage, but um, the piece in the film that was absolutely true as they go side by side is how they were looking at the aero, putting taping little bits of wool onto the bodywork and then taking pictures and watching them to see which bits moved and which bits didn't. Change of lead then as the red car goes through into the lead. That's the Van der Poel at Driven Machine. He'll pass that over to Jim Farley at some stage during this race. Problems on the circuit at Arnage again, and that's the Marcos that stopped. Yeah, but so. Uh, at least Marcos did race in period here at Le Mans. And now we've got side by side action again, John. Terrific stuff between these two GT40s. The Alaman Red and Gold car just drops behind Eric van der Poel. All that um, Le Mans experience. All so that's that the lead changing back yeah, the other way. Back. That's twice on the Mulsanne straight that it has changed. But it looks to me as though the draft is strong with these two. Still, you'll see the front end of the cars lift at speed and drop when they break. And again, they're side by side. Doesn't seem to be slowing them down much with the third place car of Diogo Frau, the Portuguese driver, some five seconds back from this battle now to Mulsanne Corner. Oh, they're giving it absolutely everything right to the edge of the track. The V8 engine singing beautifully in the bright afternoon sunshine and Lynn father and son have moved up to fifth and sixth place in fact having a terrific battle with the the Portuguese driven roadster keeps splitting them and then that uh, position has gone backwards and forwards for that that uh, sixth place yeah that is the the light green car that looks like somebody's put a big sunroof in it it's actually not so far away from that uh, it uh, still has the doors on it, that's the, uh, the light green number yeah, 73, Rui de Macedo da Silva. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Oh, that Marcos is right oh, in the firing line is. there. Green flag almost picked that car up as the cars went through. And that was a very close moment indeed. So, our 66 car has pulled off and... Uh, well, that is the Marcus, the mini oh, Marcus. still the Marcus, it's just a close yeah, shot. Yeah. This, that's, a, that's a different Marcus, actually. That's not the Gen Mark. Oh, the that's another one. one. Oh. That's the Dominique Bruchier, Cyril oh. Lamarent, and uh, Nico, Nico Joffre. So that's a, a Marcus mini, a mini Marcus GT from 1967. Yeah. That's the 1300cc. Yeah. And we've gone engine. to a slow. Yeah. Yeah. We've gone to a slow zone uh, there, which will stretch back uh, a number of Marshall's posts. I think slow zone six starts just after the Mulsanne right-hander. So this is going to allow the leading cars to absolutely pull away um, because that's not going to get changed anytime soon. Uh, slow moving for GT uh, further down the field, which I think was the number 76 car. The Marcus has been pulled away by a hard-working Marcus with the assistance Marshalls with the assistance of a snatch tractor. Uh, thousands of marshals here again this weekend. Our very great thanks to them. Yeah, the GT40 offers the uh, French-driven car Henri Richard and Nicolas Leroy Florio. But that wasn't in contention. Just on the, the, the Lynn father and son battle, Dad is leading son Maxwell at the moment. Maxwell, younger brother of Alex Lynn, yeah. well-known Formula E and... Um, endurance driver, of course. Uh, but in the night, Maxwell beat Sean, and um, the sponsorship may be, be withdrawn. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Maxwell, Maxwell's never raced here before. He's new into a GT40. Um, Andy Newell running that car, and uh, Andy Wall, sorry, running that car, and uh, doing a great job. The, the, uh, his car, the, the number, nine, number nine car, has got a good history. Um, but the one that Sean Lynn is driving, which is 
with the registration plate, you'll see it, Tessie, that hasn't got much of a history at all. It did take part in the Brighton Speed Trials, so I'm told. Ah, oh, that's the, the drag races down the, oh, it's the promenade. Yeah. A, an, an absolutely bizarre and, in some ways, anachronistic event, because you think of Brighton as the... Uh, rather genteel yes. coastal town, um, a, uh, a place where the, the royals used to go to, to have their, uh, their holidays and the, uh, the well healed. Side by side again, it's been going since about 1930, that yeah, event. absolutely. And used to be a big stop on the British motor racing calendar. Correct. Important stop, part, big names there. It was part of the summer season, wasn't it? I, I, well? I've been to the event, it's a lot of fun. Oh, shortcut yeah. on the chicane oh, yeah. for the number 44. Yeah. Yeah. The, Christian Clarkson yet to get in that car, but they're still battling hammer and tongs. Pretty sure, yeah, I'm pretty sure it is Perez in it, looking at the way it's going. And uh, his father, British rally champion in the past, runs a company that sells... Um, Steve Perez. So that's, Steve that's, Perez, that's Steve Perez's son. son, yeah. Oh, right. He's done a lot of Porsche racing. Oh, company. my goodness, I, yeah. I hadn't made the connection. Yeah. Isn't that odd? Yeah. Uh, does, does race and run. He's one of the few people that does both disciplines, which I think is great. I think it should be mandatory. Yeah. The golf coloured... Sort of golf coloured. Yeah. Some it's key lines that are... 70... Uh, sorry, 24 car. 24 car. Which is the Ludovic Caron. Ludovic yeah. Caron car. Now, it's interesting that Caron is the fastest French guy in a Cobra normally, and a, he had a very good result here last year. Certainly we had a podium result, and he switched to this Cobra. Uh, and, uh, 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 and I just feel he, he, he hasn't quite got a feel for it yet, because he's a very quick peddler. They, they have a particular uh, set of characteristics, GT40s, I have been told. Uh, not I've sat in one, I've yeah. never driven one. You will notice that that left-hand door, the driver's side door, is a different colour on that lady car. That was after uh, the door went missing. Oh, now this is not good, no. because the pit window isn't open for another two and a half minutes. So the number three Ford uh, GT. Uh, we could say the cluts, the three cluts are driving. Yeah, well, absolutely. Well, uh, cluts are clots. Now, here's the interesting part. Of all the cars uh, on the entry list, all that, all that's an over, overheating V8. Their engine sizes are listed in cubic centimetres, apart from this one, which is 289, uh, 289 cubic inches. Cubic inches. Which I suspect is still the 4.7. It is. Yeah, it, 4 it definitely 7. translates to that, yeah. yeah. Well, this is just an incredible battle, John. Look at that, wheel to wheel, passing and repassing each other. Young, up and coming driver from Derbyshire, from Chesterfield, Derbyshire, against a seasoned pro from Belgium. And this time, Van der Poel gets the yeah. uh, advantage coming through the Ford chicane. Eric Van der Poel, who was... His trademark was wearing a hat. Yes. Always wore a wide-brimmed hat in the pit lane. Cowboy, cowboy hat. Yeah, like yeah. Cowboy. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, I should have said. And, uh, yeah, raced a lot in America as well, Eric. And... Uh, but characteristic orange on his crash helmet might just catch a flash of it. No, not quite there. And Perez tries to go through the inside. The tail slides out, but he holds it until this battle continues. Magnificent tussle between these two. GT40 is one of my all-time favourite racing cars. Very easy to get the tail sideways out of the Dunlop chicane because you're cresting the brow and there's a little camber on the road there as well. Don't ask me how I know that. Uh. Down through the Forest S's and towards Turt Rouge. And this is a quick corner for any car, but for, for particularly for these cars. We are lapping, by the way, in under four and a half minutes yeah. in these cars from the mid-1960s. Out through Turt Rouge, side by side again, a little wiggle, even on the up change there from the red and gold number one. They are in two different classes, these cars. The GTP 12C and TSRC 12. Not I, sure what um, the differences I between them are. Cannot imagine why. It does look as though the one car is slightly wider body, but I, maybe slightly, but it could just be a trick of the colour schemes. They've both missed several parts of the circuit. There's the number three, I'm afraid, yeah, it's not Canadian, going anywhere. Canadian owned car. Uh, originally Swiss, of course, Peter Klutz still listed as his, uh, with his Swiss 
nationality of Orion and Gary, uh, Canadian nationals. Well, wow, this is nip and tuck all the way, coming up to an MG in a light Wedgwood blue colour. Very popular in the mid-1960s on British Leyland, British Motor Company, as it would have been in those days. Yeah, the um, second of those cars in the Allen Band colours, red and gold. Saw those colours on many different cars from... Uh, a lot of Cort Fords. Cortinas, yeah. yeah. And uh, obviously developed the Ford 3L after this. I'm not, I haven't checked, but this is a genuine Allen Band chassis. Some of these, quite a few of these GT40s are originals, some aren't. Um, and yes, it's absolutely, John, you can see that, that new door that's been uh, bolted on. One of the most reproduced cars of all time, the GT40. A number of people uh, making very good yeah. uh, tool room replicas, shall we say. Yeah, both for the road and racing. You, yeah. It makes a nice road car. Ford did produce some of these cars specifically for the road, yeah. but it was primarily a racer. And... I, I mean, this is another car that is very difficult to get in and out of. As a road car, if you were dressed up nicely to go out, yeah. um, the sills are huge. You sit yeah. almost in the middle of the car as the driver. Yeah, I, I, I have driven one um, a long time ago. Um, Right-hand gear shift, which you catch your leg on every time you get in and out. Um, engine behind you, of course, so you don't have to worry about burning your leg on the exhaust as you get out, which you had to with the... Chrysler and Dodge Viper. That, that's, that uh, just caught shot of the Shelby Cobra. That's a very famous car that uh, actually raced by Carroll Shelby. Dan Gurney, Ken Miles raced that car. But now with, um, I think it might have Paul Belmondo in it. Oh, really? He, he was listed down as one of the four drivers. So this is the 68 car that Andrew is yep. talking about with the rainbow stripes on it. And... This is a 1963 289, so that's a 4.7 uh, litre V8. Looked a leisurely pit stop. The uh, guy who looked who was going to take the car over put the, the crash helmet on the roof of the car. Oh, he might have had it on if he's going to jump into it. Maybe he knows he's not going to drive it after all. There are only two places for a crash helmet on your head or on the floor. Never put it anywhere where it can fall over. Uh, the pit window has been open for about a minute, so. That's why everybody's diving in the pit lane, including a slew of MGs. And they're going to work underneath the front of that car, so it is going to be a rather more leisurely stop. And we've got, oh dear, a problem right. for the Ford GT40 number nine. This is the Max Lynn car that was running well up. Oh dear, what's happened to that? Slow on the track and Fan showing is stopped at the moment. Our first two cars come in, and, and the Alabama car effectively blocking the one car That's because smart. the MGB is in the way. Oh, and, look, uh, the TZ's come in behind at the 21. Yeah, I'm seeing Eric van der Poel is out of the car. There's his uh, famous orange and green crash helmet, so Jim Farley will have climbed aboard. Thierry Pasco and Alexandra Fior Fiorani, Fiorani with the red number 21. Yeah. Alfa Romeo Julia TZ2 yeah. from 65, and beautiful. A, a, a glass all is climbing in, that's Perez strapping him in now. So what? Oh! oh 26R goodness. going around at Turt Rouge, the number 25. That's the Jorge Vergas Clermont car, another Swiss driver. Swiss racing licenses are far better value than anywhere else in Europe. I didn't know that. Is Shh. that so? Apparently so. Uh, yeah. And. Now, the Nathan uh, van der Kerkhover car. Oh, it looked like it was going out. That's a yeah. change. In the, yeah. There's a problem for the 44. Yep. The Glasgow car has not rejoined the dark blue. It isn't black, it's dark blue with the red stripe. Number one. What a colour that is. That looks like you could put your hands in it. It's so deep, that colour of the number one car. So that's Jim F uh, Farley in it now. I think they're still waiting for the pit stop. Is that because Van der Poel was in the car? Could be, just Seb standing there. Seb standing there. No, I don't know, Van der Poel was in the other car. He's in the other car, so yeah. that doesn't work, does it? I don't um, understand. Oh, the e tight having a big... Up. It was locking up, wasn't he, going off, I think. But, uh... Uh, 
No, that's engine hand through. Oh, it is. You're absolutely right. Don. Silver with it's red. Blown up. Unusual colour for that car, but it actually works. Finally. So why were they longer on the pit stop? Yeah. They are in different classes, remember. So mm. maybe there's different uh, minimum times. So uh, actually, they do you think he got a penalty for coming in? Like no, I. I they were further apart when they came in than I'd realised because they were already cleaning the screen Ooh, yeah. and uh, buckling in the other driver. Smoky oil smell there for the marshals. The driver's already out. That's on the run. Oh, there was it blowing up. That was on the run down between oh, no, uh, between Mulsan and Indianapolis. I'm sorry, I haven't identified the car yet. That's um, the one. They might get a shot of it. Who's dropped down the, the That's order. what I'm looking yeah. at to see what has happened to them. Now, the Scuderia Philippine, uh, Philip that's Pinetti. Max. Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, Maxwell uh, in that car. Maxwell Lynn. Dark grey and light grey Ford in as well. The <laughs> number 50 of uh, Dominic Grinat and Maxime Grinat. Another 4.8, 65 car. Just checking out some of the... Uh... Ah, the door's open again. Oh, no, that's ridiculous. Ah, this is twice that this has happened. Bit of yellow tape is on there. They had to borrow a door from someone else yeah. because they lost one out what? on the circuit. What happened, I, I was told, the window blew out first yeah. and then the door went after it. Obviously, haven't fixed it to, to satisfaction. Well, and, that's uh, going to have uh, to be that, fixed. That, isn't yeah, it? I mean, that's a disaster for that car, isn't it? That's the uh, leading. So all this is playing into the hands of the two that were first and second last year. Uh, Farrell, the Portuguese driver, and Freitmeier, the, uh, the German. But meanwhile, Sean Lynn has stayed out there, hasn't he, at the moment? He hasn't made his pit stop. Freitmeier's Belgian. The Belgian, sorry, yeah. yes, Freitmeier's Belgian. Emil. I bet he's from near the border. I'm sure. Uh, now, uh, how, about, how about this for you, sir? Nice. Uh, 250 LM from 1964 in blue, if you don't mind. Yes, yeah, brand new, that car. Is it? Yes, the owner had it built recently. That's Clive Joy. Yeah, it? Clive Joy. He's got a lot of nice cars. Um, yeah, he um, was very pleased with it, too. V12, uh, uh, 250cc each of the cylinders for 3.3 yeah. uh, litres. And again, car. the back of that car, those raised arches yeah, with beautiful. the uh, intakes in them. And look at the new Ferrari 296. There is the evocation of that original styling. But in 65, of course, a, a, a 250 LM like that, driven by Jochen Rint and Maston Gregory, who won this race, maybe with Ed Hoogers in the night. I've got the interview from him, direct face-to-face. -face. He said he did drive in the night, who knows. This is um, Tessie, as it's called. This is the number 30. Yeah, I can't wait. Uh, uh, number two, excuse me. Uh, Sean says, not really a car with great history, but he loves it. Sean Lynn from second, so the Diogo Frau and oh. Sean Lynn coming into the pit lane, TES1E, a genuine number plate. In the UK, you can't just pick your plates. They have to have been uh, uh, either issued or potentially have been issued in yep. period. You're not allowed to make your car look younger than it is. And yeah. in those days, it would have been three letters, then up to three numbers, and then a suffix, which told you which year it was. So, E being 1964 into 65, or 65 into 66, I have to work that out now. B was 64, C, 65, D, no, 66. E must have been 66 into 67. Sliding the GT40 around. Developed by Carl Shelby. Organisation Ken Miles, who mentioned the film, terrific effort. I thought. Oh, we got an E-type off in the gravel. He's found a way out of it though, and uh, that is uh, Stefan. Oh, uh, well, I think it maybe Will Nuttall was going to drive that car. Okay. Well-known preparer, um, IN Racing. Two, two Germans, uh, the Koenig family, Stefan and Philippe. Well, uh, with that uh, 3.8. Yeah. And he's knocked the. 
uh, plexiglass uh, roll and the front right indicator and running light of that car, bit of damage on the wing as well. Now, will this V8 fire in the light blue Ford in the pit lane as the marshals push the stricken and are still, I'm afraid, as yet unidentified. Yeah. BFR 416, now I should know that. Mm, the doesn't ring a bell with me, that particular one. Like the colour scheme, the silver with the, the red stripes. I did go around the paddock, John, trying to put some colour schemes mm. against the programme, but with 800 cars, a bit difficult. 33 is another 26R, that's the Patrice Gay and uh, Guillaume Brajeur. 1600cc, very lightweight car, fantastic balance on the car, even though it's front engine yeah. and rear drive, everything's in proportion. Very interesting chassis because it's got a centre spline Correct. and riggers that come off to hold the four suspension. Uh, now, it's back in again with a lot of tank tape. Well, a lot of different coloured tank tape as well. They obviously didn't have uh, dark blue. See the sticker green. on the back? Dan Gurney for president. Says. Yeah, well, that, they, that was period. Yeah, that was uh, period, absolutely. Late 60s into the early 70s, there was uh, genuine thought that uh, Dan might go into politics. If you've ever met Dan, you know he would have let, 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 lasted about five minutes in politics because he said what he meant and he meant what he oh, said. So that's the team. I mean, a bit of discussion about why the door came open again. French team running that car. F very fortunate to have Mr Gurney's signature on a beautiful black and white print of him racing here. Yeah, I saw it, I think, recently. Yeah. Looks terrific. In the drawing room. So the leading car, then, has pitted. So who have uh, we got ahead? We should have yeah. the Brett Meyer car in the lead now, the number 38. The se No, sorry, the 74's thorough? back out again. We've got a slow zone, and this is the big slow zone at the bottom end of the track, the southern end of the track. The 26 so are having some remedial yeah. work done as well on the rear. So what's that uh, holding up? So we had the two front-running cars, both in problems. Perez came in to hand over to the German, I believe, owner of the car, and uh, for some reason was delayed. And then we've had the, the, the car that he's battling with, with Eric van der Poel at the wheel, but that was uh, delayed with the door. The... the Clutch family outing, Clutch family outing in the pit lane and ready to go back out again with that black and white number three. Canadian National Day earlier on this weekend. Oh, yeah. They celebrated it in style here. Red and white number 74 then is the Portuguese Diogo Ferrao car. Now, I haven't got another uh, driver against that one. No, no, he drives out on his own as right. he did last year. And uh, Diogo drove to victory here last year. Very strong the other night. Again. Yeah. And uh, last year, um, Belgian guy Breitmeier was third, because Jim Farley was second overall, oh, di right. driving without Harry Van der Poel. But obviously, the door problems have uh, negated a repeat of that. Um, Bitsarini coming through traffic with the leader not too far behind. Headlights are blazed. All the lights, fog lights and driving lights in place as well. The 23 E-Type uh, leads, leaves the pit lane, which is a 1963 French registered machine and it's driven by a uh, Frenchman, Sebastien Berchon. Quick shout out for, we mentioned Ludovic Caron, the guy switched from the, the Cobra, who's now dropping down the field, incidentally. I just dropped behind Ollie Bryant, who's going really well in that. A uh, much less powerful Porsche 9046. Uh, Caron's a, a three times winner. Check that. Two times winner of the Tour Auto, uh, the, the big uh, event which basically re reproduces what happened in the 60s, uh, where there was races and rallies, a great big event around France, and even the Matra Le Mans cars took part in it. The number 54 GT40, the Gwynat Dominique Maxime, Swiss pairing for the pit lane exit. Rather too many people, I think, oh. caught out by that this this weekend. Uh, Rado Freitas will have briefed the drivers earlier on this weekend. But I don't think we've had any actual fights, have we? Just no, uh, uh, I haven't maybe looked at that, actually. Yeah. Bitterini just being passed yeah. by the leader. 
And at this number uh, six, 5.3 GT. It's Peter Muelder and Christian Traber yeah. in that car. So I, German Swiss. I, I have told you this story before. I've been in a Bizzarini, which was owned by a friend of mine, and I have been in it with a bloke, the then editor of Motor News, driving it on the M1 at 150 miles an hour before the speed limit. We should say before speed limit. It was a long, that was that must have been a small It's down to Andrew that we have speed limits in the UK ah. at Pit Lane Andy. <laughs> blame Pit Lane Andy. Please no, please no. <laughs> So, oh no! Don't get me going on 20 mile an hour speed limits with bicycles passing all the time in Newcastle. Well, I'm, I'm with the red well, flag in front of us, sir. Interesting. Some of these cars. I think that might be a fine. Car. Some of these cars had the one we had had riveting all down the roof. You know, all the panels were riveted, and the rivets actually were, were, were visible. It looked absolutely magnificent. Fans here enjoying this great sellout occasion. Sellout occasion. Can't For those of you on radio, Andrew's describing what's what going we're on, on the screen on the uh, what's going on in the pit lane boxes. All I'm, of the pit I'm, lane boxes I'm, are sold out this weekend. I'm, I'm feeling sorry for people that uh, obviously, if you're driving somewhere and listening to it, great. But to get the full experience, obviously, you've got to see it on the screen. Our pictures are better on radio. But are you, sir, I think you said, John, you, you will be able to, to see this. Um, all, all of the uh, uh, visual archive will be available. In fact, yesterday's is already there. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and we've got the links to it via RadioLamont.com and our special page. Our audio is already up from yesterday as well and will go up across the weekend. It's Tim Greer who is uh, our executive producer yeah, thank in you, London, Tim. doing his excellent job as ever. These two Ford GTs, you know, they're not that far apart. The traffic, I no. think, has played just a little bit into Emil Britmer's uh, hands here, and he's cut that down to 2.3 seconds. Yeah, they weren't last year. We were like this all last year, and here they are again. Britmer has not got his headlamps on in the same way as the James, as the um, Diego Diego Ferrao car has. Don't know so much about Brit Meyer, um, as you say, a Belgian driver, John, um, but with quite a lot of success racing on the continent in historic events. But he's not somebody that, like, for instance, comes over to Goodwood. Problem for MG the MG GP. number 11. This is an MGB from 1964, one of the uh, 1850cc cars. French, French driver, ben Benjamin Engron. And thank you to our Navette driver last night, Benjamin. Who oh, he was, was Benjamin, wasn't it? Yeah. Very, very helpful indeed. Got us where we needed to go. Made, made sure we Got. missed the Bouchon. We were Tref Louis everywhere we went. We were Pat indeed. Bouchon. The, the Sun Beam Tiger is still going along with Chris Bain. Ah, oh, and of course, the bright red number 80. Oh. That's the Porsche 9046. Carlos de Casada, the US driver. Just a two litre flat six in that car. So typical Porsche horizontally opposed Boxster engine. Uh, Boxer engine, sorry, he, should he, I say it? He runs in the um, in the IMSA series on occasion at Allegro Motorsport. Correct. He, he uh, certainly had a good run for a couple of seasons in the Porsche uh, GT3 Challenge, as it was then, and we see him in IMSA competition. Couple of E-type lightweights battling through Dunlop side by side, nose to tail for a moment, heading down, trying to chase down the Cobra, as Snowy says, I should say, it's Cobra. 31 is the Maurizio Bianco and uh, Paolo Cavalieri from South Africa now. Paolo, uh, the 1964 car and chasing it is the 63 car of Armandville and Richardville. You may recognise yes, those names. indeed. Uh, best of the non-GT40s is Olivier Gallant uh, in uh, uh, 64 Shelby Cobra Daytona Coupe. So there's quite a lot of Shelby Coupes racing. Most have been built in the last four or five years. I know that there is one in France original uh, which is owned by the guy who owned ATS 
lifts and it was a big sponsor of Pescarolo. Interesting to me that the first half dozen of four GTs, uh, if you count the roadster, then you've got a couple of Shelby Cobras, then another four, uh, little gaggle of four GT40s, then another Cobra, but then you've got three E-types together. Yeah. It does seem as though we're getting little bunches of similar yeah. cars, which tends but, to, of course, they have the similar performance. Yeah. But, John, the E-type was built as a road car and they developed a competition Correct. car from it. GT40 the other way round. And uh, what would you say about the Cobra? It was put, developed for the road and track, really, simultaneously, I would say. But the Daytona Coupe is, of course, built to beat Ferrari in what was then the World Sports Car Championship, effectively, Pete and Brock. did so, and really annoyed Ferrari a lot. Massively. Uh, Peter Brock penned the styling of yeah. that to get the aero right over the back for the high speeds of the just, Daytona. Just for clarification, two Peter Brocks. Yes, this Australian was the racing one. Onion, and yeah. this is the American photographer and car designer. Did a great job. It's lovely, Lo Peter. lovely bloke. I've known him ever since I was over yeah. in the States. Another chance to speak about the, <laughs> to say it, uh, the Alpha Romeo. Julia TZ from 1965, 1600cc engine. There's two of them in the race. And the body styling on that is out of this world. Not Disco Volante out of this world, flying saucer, but certainly superb. Looks great with that little Alpha grill as well. The lead now, 5.3 seconds from Diogo Ferrao Farra to Emil Britmeier. Then another 15 seconds back to Sean Lynn, that is, isn't it, in the, uh, the number two car? Yes, it is. Max Lynn had problems yep. earlier on in Sean his car. Sean Lynn had made a lot of money in the city of London. Clever trader. Best to Ilan. I'm looking at Ilan because we'd hoped to get a car in this. Um, I'm sure we would have been quite a bit higher than that. With, uh, 25th, Giles, uh, sorry. Giles Dawson is a big pedal and it's a supercar. So, so that's, that's the Vargas Clement car, the number yeah. 25, uh, that is sitting down. Oh. I've got to get me... There's that picture in. Square, ..square this down. And where is that number 25 car? It's down outside the top 20, at least. But it is leading its class, so you can't expect I know, yeah. anything more than that. There was quite that. a few lands. That's the best one. But anyway, I think we, we hope to come in two years' time with the deal. With I think it's 30th at the moment. I think it's 33 yeah. on the page from, from memory. So, uh, Does the car have the modern history that you're working with? Absolutely not. It's got no history at all. That's probably the one of the problems. Yeah, yeah. But it's quick. It's quick. Tails away out of Arnage. And the number 49 is the Austin Healy. Sprite prototype from 1966 with the slightly different bodywork on. That's Julian Ellison's car. Meantime, at the front of the field, uh, Diego Ferrao still leading this race and by an increasing margin, he's up to five seconds now into the pits for the number six. What a beautiful car that Bitterini is. Uh, uh, John, into the booth comes Peter Snowden. Snowy is back, having had his lunch. I suppose we should just recap for him what's been had a very interesting battle with different GT40s leading. Uh, Eric van der Poole in the Jim Farley car. They had door problems yesterday. They've had them again today, which has held them up. Um, we've had a problem in the pits for uh, young uh, Perez, which uh, held him up. So Farrar, who won this last year, is leading it again. Under four minutes to go. And still battles around the circuit with the Jaguar E-Type, the Bianco Cavieri car, and the Fermenge Morza Cobra battling for position out on the track. And the E-Type goes around the outside and goes off at Turt Rouge. There goes the Cobra through on the inside, the silver. And... Uh, it's camouflaged just in case any other manufacturers see what the body shape is. I'm not sure what that is all about in the car. Yeah, about well, it's sort of, uh, well, it's, it's arty, I think you'd say. It looks a lot to, I mean, it looks like graffiti on it. E-type e coming back, dives to the right, now to the left. It's the outside line going into the Daytona chicane, so the...
Cobra making the right move and easing back onto the racing line. Turns left-handed. Meantime, behind them, the race leader starting to close them down. 48 car with a penalty. Is that significant? No, it's not in the top positions. Pit stop in Prince. Oh, one lap penalty oh. for the 24 and the 25. Now, there. That might be wow. class relevant. Yes, that's the Elan. That is the 26R that's leading its class. And, uh, wow. And the, and the Tour de France winner, uh, Tour Auto, winner Caron, he's got a big penalty as well. All right. So that drops. That, that is also a class leader. Yeah, yeah. So that's a whole lap. So that's going to take them out of contention. Uh, presentations for the race and for the three lap aggregate. We are on the final lap now as we head towards our last couple of races of the weekend. Thank you for being with us. It's been a little bit of a conflagration between the number 12 Ford GT and the 57 MGB which is being looked at. In fact, it's under investigation at the moment. So, on to the final lap for these cars. As, ah, the Pizzerini. No, it's the Alpha. The, the other Alpha, the 64 TZ, has, has stopped at Dunlop. The number eight rather than the number six but that is not going to affect the leader. They'll be finished next time around. Diogo Ferrao leading Emil Brettmeyer, then Sean Lynn. And we put Christian Glasel in, didn't we, to finish the race yeah. in the, the 44 car. So he looks like he's going to come in fourth position, but winning his class. Three of those top four, although they're all four GT40s from 1965, are in different classes. Go, G go figure. GTP 12C, GTP 12, TSRC 12, and so three of the top four, as I say, in different categories. Now it's just the run home through the Porsche curves. the dark blue number 38 so the top three in order in this race will be the top three overall oh, really? it makes it nice and simple for right. once doesn't it okay two for the class winners as we mentioned other class winners well Jim Farley and Eric van der Perle will win their class finishing in fifth position with uh, probably the only car to have had three races and two doors this weekend <laughs> different colours as well uh, another for GT40 that will win is the Ludo Caron number 24 car. As with the Donchier number 53. The Jaguar E type for the Bianco and Cavalieri combination will win its class, the number 31 car. The GTP Brighton Smith machine will win as well. Across the line then for Diogo Ferrar, the Portuguese driver in his red and white for GT takes the final race for plateau number three and will, according to our very unofficial calculations, will win the overall as well. Remember the aggregate times of all three races for each of the plateau. Through in second, Emil Brittmeyer, Sean Lynn in third. Those are your top three in the overall of this plateau. Winning the class in fourth position. Christian Glasel and Perez. Let me do some more class leaders. The Joy Malsha, number 30, 250LM Ferrari wins its class. And one of the Lotus. So it's the number 25. Wow. So that penalty for the number 25 of a lap. And they've yet to finish. So we've got to wait here because that's put it only 
half a second ahead of its closest rivals, the two Bordans in the number 20. In fact, they've lost it. They've lost it on the last lap. So that one lap penalty and the Bordans have gone through then to take the victory as it stands. But there's only half a second between them and they're having a cracking battle out on the circuit. They're first and second in the GTS, GTS 10 category. So this is 39 and 45. They're still to come to the line. We'll keep an eye out for the little 26 Rs. Huge amount of brake smoke coming from the left front of the number 86. That being the E-type. So that is A26R. Is that the 26R we're looking for? No, it's not. That's the 79 car, a little bit further down the field. Uh, the uh, Pascal Duhamel 1964 version. And across the line, and the Bordans have taken it back on the line by eight tenths of a second. So the 39 car, after the penalty for the number 25, the two Elans in GTS 10, just eight tenths of a second, separating them across the line. Brilliant stuff. That was a pit stop infringement. Well, that was worth the price of admission on its own. Wrapping up the weekend for our 1962 to 1965 grid. And those cars at least now finished for the weekend, although of course some of the weekend, uh, some of the, the drivers will carry on with what they have to do this weekend. Live from Le Mans, uh, this is audio and video seamlessly integrated, RS1 around the world. If you are bandwidth compromised or perhaps driving, maybe you're on a plane at the moment and tuned in, watching and or listening. And of course, on YouTube, a variety of syndications, all free, no blocks or breaks. Just finishing the very light green Roadster GT40. To say, I've not seen one of those before. That's a new one of me. And not surprising because that is one of one. Well, it started as we expected with a phalanx of Ford GT40s at the front of the field. And it looked as though we were going to get a good race, and indeed we did. Just glorious sound with the Shelby Daytona Coupes in there as well. It boiled down early on to a battle at the front of the field between the Eric van der Poel driven number one car and the Alan Mann coloured red and gold machine, the number 44 of uh, Young Perez and Christian Glasel. Unfortunately, those two fell by the wayside. It was magnificent stuff, though, for a while. Door to door racing with a good supporting cast behind them. Very close to picking up the Mini Marcos GT that had stopped coming out of, that was this number 66, the Marcus JT that stopped coming out of Indianapolis. It was pushed away by our hard working marshals and the yellow flags were lifted so we could go racing again. If we weren't looking at the four GTs at the front of the field, we were looking at the Cobras and the Cobra Coupes and the E-types, which were fighting on. Then in the pits, a little bit of a problem for the number 44, it was held for quite a long time. That allowed Diego Ferrao through into the lead. Spinning 26R, just avoided by two Porsches and a Healy. 908 GTS, 986. Uh, falling by the wayside. 
and at the end, Diego Ferral taking this victory ahead of Emil Brettmeyer and Sean Lynn. And they are the top three finishers in this plateau in terms of the overall positions. The backside's filling up again as the Patron come back after lunch. Confirmation of the winners. Three single crude cars in the top three places. Christian Glazel sharing his car. Olivier Gonlin in fifth position. Plenty of class winners as well in the top 30. Another huge grid of the cars from 1966 to 1971. Excuse me, from... Uh, uh, class 4 which was 62 to uh, 65 we'll move on to the later cars in a wee moment time to welcome back Peter Snowden to the booth hot and sticky outside Peter it certainly is, and that's before we get into a race car around yes, here. Yes, absolutely. Uh, which it will be. Certainly some of those, uh, the GT40s. I've, I've had the pleasure of racing one of those, and they are, well, the, the GT40 for a reason, 40 being, we all know, it's the roof height, 40 inches. The real fact, the reality of that is, it's very claustrophobic in one of those. You've got a massive V8 sitting right behind you with, they call it a bulkhead, which I think is an, an engineering term. It's a sheet of aluminium at best. So what One is step up from being kitchen foil. It's a radiator, basically, yeah. <laughs> sitting, right, sitting right behind you. So comfort it is not. And, of course, as you said earlier, uh, you're wearing triple-layer suits. Uh, it's, it's, the worst, it's the worst possible kit to be wearing in a car, not what you need at all. We move on to the 1966-71 to 71 era here at Le Mans. era that goes from the Ford victory in 1966 to just after the four first Porsche win of 19 that they have overall and taking us through to 1971 let's hear from a driver well-known driver Gerard Larousse spoke to Laurent earlier on in the weekend Bonjour Gerard Larousse, on est ravi de vous retrouver mais vous savez moi Laurent saying it's great to speak to you, never mind the 100th anniversary, it's your anniversary here as well. He says, yeah, I enjoyed driving and winning with Henri Pescarola, too kind, he said, by the way. Vous avez apprécié effectivement la Great course de Ferrari winning in the big race oui, this year tout, again. J'ai trouvé que la course était magnifique. Euh, oh, bon, was a great euh, event and race. Sur le plan sportif et sur le plan de la mécanique aussi que Ferrari arrive à faire une voiture euh, du premier coup qui gagne, c'est quand même to see Ferrari back in the top class. Le Mans classique alors. Now, vous what êtes about fidèle. the classic? Bah, je suis fidèle euh, oui, euh, je dis que dès que le Mans classique a lieu, je viens, j'ai couru. Cette année, je vais pas courir mais je vais faire quelques tours. Avec He's back, not just watching. Cette année, le, le lien entre les deux événements est plus naturel que jamais. Est-ce que ça a toujours été aussi pour vous naturel que le Mans Classique Is finalement soit après le Mans Is it usual for him oui, to be here? Je pense que cette année, le Mans Classique profite de la de l'aura des 24 heures du Mans qui ont eu yeah. la victoire de Ferrari qui ont amené beaucoup de gens pour, pour it, cette uh, Following on from the victory from Ferrari, it's great to be part of the Classic. Merci Gérard Larose, merci beaucoup. And he is out in, well, he's certainly listed in this race. Uh, Gérard Larousse, who I once heard an American PA commentator called Jerry Larousse, uh, which I thought was interesting. Um, 66, obviously, Ford victory, big celebrations, 1970, Porsche victory, their first overall. A, a bit of a changing of the guards in this period. Again, a relatively short amount of years, Peter, 
but we we went from the Ford versus Ferrari battles to the beginning of what was to be in the 1970s um, not total domination but certainly Porsche particularly with their factory and indeed with their private ear teams really making their mark on this race well we mentioned it before haven't we about the sort of the, the post-war bit and the, the the British British involvement and then the American involvement and that as you say it ended almost precisely perfectly for it in terms of a decade 1969 a lot of win for GT40 with Jackie Eakes and Jackie Oliver. 1970, you get the new decorate and you get a new manufacturer winning, Porsche, for the first time, Richard Atwood. And uh, it, it, it developed for a while. Porsche then went right through to the 80s uh, and, and won and won and won. Of course, back in it now, the new 90, 963 hypercar, still there, manufacturers. And these, they go in and out, but it's absolutely cyclical. It's been Toyota's uh, playground for a while, the last five years, until Ferrari have come back again. Who's next? I'm going to say... Jaguar, please. You've, you, uh, you're banging that drum. Uh, it, it may be in a vacuum uh, at the moment. <laughs> you're welcome to my career. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, I think we can all say that. A wonderful, another wonderful grid that has been uh, assembled by the uh, Peter organisation, who, I, I won't say they've worked miracles, but it must be close. I, I would say they have. Uh, pa uh, Pat yeah. Peter saying early on that uh, in the weekend that they had to turn away um, several hundred entries. I mean, there are only so many. We do only have the six, uh, the six plateaus here, and it's uh, you know. So our youngest cars are the cars that will finish off the day today, as we've gone through them in chronological order, which takes us up to 1981. Um, We'd have to have two weekends, I think, if we extended this very much further. And clearly, closing the roads for three days and the attendant uh, costs of putting this on, it's just not going to happen. Uh, Lawler's to the fore here. So Deutschland über Alice is the title, um, slightly tongue-in-cheek, I think, here by the French organisers. But the top four are... Uh, Huntingdon's finest, Lola T70s from 1969. The Hearts are back, the Lopez Ellery car. Uh, we're back with Ollie Bryant and Luisa Mill as well. Uh, Mr. John of B with Soya Layari sharing the leash year. Surprise packet. This, though, is Steve Brooks, who won the first race yesterday. Uh, and uh, David Hart, David Hart, who is at the wheel, won the second. Uh, the Steve Brooks car. A real original ex Sid Taylor racing one. It's not, it's not a recreation. Sid Taylor had about five of these cars. This was the main car he had, driven by the likes of Brian Redman and all sorts of other quick people. So that's a, that's a, an original five litre V8 in a Lola T70 Mark III B, is it? Yeah. Lola T70s did race here with Aston Martin engines in, Peter. Remember, a John Surtees project, oh, wow. which um, turned out to be disastrous. Yeah, 1967, the Lola no. Aston, with it, what, what was the, the embryonic uh, V8 en engine uh, designed by Tadek Merrick again, went into a 5340 oh, capacity exactly, 5.3, but it was a 5-litre form here, and it was terrible. It, yeah, was, it was like a bag of nails in the back of a Lola. Oh, really? John Surtees condemned it. It had the wrong it, plugs in it, all sorts of things. Well, the plugs were the big issue, yeah. um, all in the David Hobbs book. Um, they did put a Chevy in it at the end. We also see, and they're a, a partner of the event here, our first Di Tommaso Prantera. It's a Group 4 car from 1971. This is the number 67 car. Keep an eye on that. Um, coming into the pit lane now, I'm not sure is the answer. To that question, and not nor might so a modern day supercar. We did see it in the paddock. I don't think the Dieter Massa has just been out. I just popped back out in, into that's the not a new Dieter. No, no, I was going to say the Dieter Massa was about to go out and do some demonstration runs. You mentioned Sid Taylor earlier, by the way. Sid Taylor did also have a T70 Spider uh, that he ran at the time, which was uh, run by uh, my mentor Colin Blower and raced for it for many years. And it was one of the few cars I, I got to test that I never got to race, unfortunately. And I can tell you, around Goodwood. It's mightily, mightily hairy in a T70 Spider. You bet. It's bad, it's bad enough with the roof, but with, the, with no roof, it's nice and buffeting, and uh, you, you feel it. Wind in the helmet. There's a Chevron B19 right up the sharp end, where it really shouldn't be. That's an 1800cc four-cylinder end for, for Rock Seagris and Davide Mazzolini. Um, just a, 
1790 in line four in that Chevron. John, the supercar, what's the supercar of the Brabham? No. No, OK. No. Um, the cost, Ignore that, then. On the screen, if you're, on the screen you'll see a, a Mark IV, seven-litre Ford that obviously won here in the, in the mid-60s. And the Helmut TX is here yeah. as well, which is the, effectively, a helicopter engine car. Uh, uh, but by that, I don't mean with a big rotor on the back. It huh? is a turbine engine car from 1968. I, I, I think that's been here pretty much every... Um, every iteration here. So, this is the so, Xavier Micheron car. Certainly here last year, yeah. It was here in the years that we covered it for, for yeah. radio. Yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, a, a continental manufacturer of helicopter motor in the back of that. Is it Augusta engine in the back of that one? A continental. Oh, Continental, right. OK. Um, so, Ollie Bryan looking for a bit of redemption here, having, um, in the first race, only done two laps. Uh, I'm not sure why. A bit difficult down there getting the word with everyone in, in the short period of time we have. But um... at RSL underscore studio for our penultimate event of our live coverage. Bright yellow number 31 is the Chevron B16, another 1800cc car. Franco Miners, an Italian. Uh, driving that car and to me the Glickenhaus has a look of a uh, the contemporary Glickenhaus has the certainly a look around the front of the Chevron B16 um, lovely looking car and uh, just all of the uh, all of the proportions absolutely right so 43 minutes on the clock for this plateau I'm going to leave you in the tender care of Andrew Marriott and first here's Peter Snowden. So we have uh, this eclectic mix to say the very least. Uh, 1966 to 1971, the Lola uh, T70 it is that's taking the line. We have got the clock, the clock has started. It's so we're heading up to Dunlop Curve for the first time to the T70s. Is one, two, three, four, and then a little open chevron there. Andrew. Open chevrons, closed, beautiful B16 chevrons, the seven litre Mark II or Mark IV Fords, they're recreations by Carcraft. But uh, interestingly, Lola T70s in this plateau, the car to have, never did very well at Omar. We mentioned the 30s one for other T70s here, wasn't the car to have. There's been a theme of that, hasn't there, throughout this yeah. one? You mentioned about the Plateau One of the, the, the Tolbos that were never particularly successful in period. Great team cars, yeah. great originality, what wonderful that? to have them out what? here, but what? they weren't successful in period, but they are now. One year they finished third and fourth. Lola T70s never achieved that. Lola GT, of course, that came here before that was the pre-runner to the GT40. Yeah, but so, the T70s also ultra successful in every other discipline yeah. of racing at the time. So D David Hart, David Hart from uh, Rotterdam, in the lead of this race at the moment, and looking to take the overall victory. I would think he would. He's had a third in the first race, won the night race. Ollie Bryant, as we said, was second in the night race, and looking to go down the inside and doesn't quite make it. So just show that he knows. It's only, it's only the first yeah, lap. Don't need to prove that he gets car 21 yeah. uh, into the pits already. That's, uh, uh, well, according to... Is that the helmet? According been, to my programme, it is. Yeah, I think it is, is yeah. It is the helmet. Yeah. The uh, so, helicopter engine car from 1968. And we do mean a genuinely helicopter engine yeah. car. Talking to uh, Steve Brooks yesterday. He was running there in third place. In the, the, we talked about the Team Elite colours earlier. The Team Elite colours were taken over by Sid Taylor Racing uh, when he uh, bought some of the assets of that team. Lovely uh, Porsche there, the number seven 908 car. Yeah, 90803 from yeah. 1971. Henri Gamperl and Marc de Siebenthal driving that car, both uh, Swiss uh, entrants in, in the... Uh, Need to think that we heard from John earlier about uh, the... Uh, British driver now based in America, uh, era motorsport boss Kyle Tilley had a fantastic run, and he's even. What did he, John say? He went from basically last to about twelfth, was it? Something like that. Yeah. Um, challenge for position there yeah. from that number seven Porsche 903. Sorry, 90803 that we just mentioned. Yeah. That in turn is sitting behind. Uh, there's a, a, a Lola there. I'm just trying to make out the car that's sitting in between it. Well, there's. Two, there's 
there's a five T seventy, so there's a low it's a Lola T seven uh, no the T seventy is in between. Oh and a Ferrari way late on the braking, locks it up. Taking Through exactly the, the same route. Yeah. That's the 32 Daytona. Uh, looking very period from uh, today's at Le Mans. That's the number 32 entry, uh, which is uh, uh, correctly littered in the programme of uh, as being a Ferrari 365 GTB stroke 4 Competizione 1975, which is its proper title. It was never called a Daytona by the factory. God, I didn't Cause, know that. Because it was so oh. successful at Daytona, everybody called it the Daytona, but its correct nomenclature is 365 GTB 4. So that car is being driven, by the way, by... Um, Alexander Ridvega and Sam Hancock later. Okay, Sam yeah, one of Sam's uh, clients. So three Lolas here. A Bryant car, very well. Known. Here is the helmet. That's the just going. Look, there'll probably be a heat haze behind it. Xavier Michelot uh, owns a company called Ascot Collection and sells lots of classic cars. But that is what he's not going to sell. He says. Not in a hurry. So. Uh, Ollie, Ollie Bryant, um, ultra successful racer in contemporary cars. I'm going to say back in the day, yeah. Ollie's, I think Ollie's only just celebrated his 40th yeah, birthday right, last year. Raced for a, a, a Corvette here, didn't he? Yeah. In, uh, about six, seven years ago. And British GT with British. a Tech 9 in Porsche back in 2007. If you go on his website, it's got a list of all the cars he's raced, and it's long. It's like almost 50 cars long. Lots I of think. scrolling required. Lots yeah. of scrolling required. But so, uh, so famous for racing is AC Cobra. Um, GPG. Yeah, lots of success at Goodwood. Ex Roger yeah. yeah. No, with, with and his father. It's, yeah, the property developers. And a, 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 a move around the outside, down it. Well, the switch uh, into the inside there, and a great move there by Ollie Bryant, showing his skill. Overtakes to David Hart. And these two have raced a lot together. Steve Brooks trying to follow yeah. as well. I thought, it, thought the opportunity, thought the door had opened there yeah. uh, over our a race leader. That's a change for position there. Uh, our race leader, of course, there was uh, David Hart. Uh, I think David started the car. I say David. Is it David? Is it David? Is it Olivia? I think it's David Hart and, it's David it's Hart and Oli Oliver. I think it's David Hart and Oliver. Yeah. Um, I think we're trying to frangle it, aren't we? We are. Even well, though the Dutch. The Dutch from Rotterdam, as I said, um, developing um, a property and so on. Uh, there, the number 12. Much later Alpine than the one we'd saw before. That's running down the field. Got a car that uh, people like Beltoise and Jarrier would have driven in period. Uh, two or three Chevrons and Lola's have got uh, camel logos on from the various Guy Edwards sponsorship deals. Well, you mentioned, of course, that uh, the lower T70s are the Mark 3B in this form, the 68, 69. Ah, there are 917 going through the picture, fantastic. But the uh, famous hippie car. And that is the genuine article there, and it's right behind a seven-litre Ford, which isn't the genuine article, but uh, still great the car craft that built these cars. And then a couple of Chevrons behind Derek Bennett was the, uh, an absolute brilliant Chapman-esque type designer from uh, Bolton in Lancashire, that had a great racing driver too, but wonderful to see the 917 hippie car. Car making progress is the Chevron B19. Uh, of Mark Davis, uh, number yeah. 20. Yeah, Mark, Mark's raced a lot. He's raced T70s. He's got a. He's raced a, a Lola T70 Spider in the past out of Belgium. Um, trades in these sort of cars and and won at Daytona 24 Classic in it too. I think he's a. I think he's Ford importer for uh, Belgium. If I'm better oh, than, is it? Better uh, than countries, uh, if I'm correct. But he's certainly making progress in that uh, very very pretty little. Uh, yeah, little Chevron. A couple of T70s haven't really given a shout to yet. Uh, Tony Seiler raced here at Le Mans many times, mainly in Porsches. Not a Swiss driver who runs a, a big uh, body shop, actually, but also trades in historic cars. Yeah, and currently fifth. And uh, there's, uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, Andrew, that the T70 wasn't particularly successful at Le Mans at this circuit back in period. Uh, but the uh, the top five are lower T70 Mark 3Bs yeah, at like, the moment. The British sports cars scene, uh, yeah. uh, they absolutely dominated in particular Sid Taylor racing, but quite a lot of other cars as well. And uh, we have the Sid Taylor card there. Um, so, Bryant, Bryant in the lead, just put in the fastest sector two, trying to pull away. 
in the family car. Graham's name listed on the side of that car. I don't think he is racing here today. That's a, I think that's the Kyle Tilly car, isn't it? Has just gone through. The yeah. one has been making its way through the field. The um, car he's going to believe share with Will Nuttall of. Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's, that's, that's the sixth place car, just to, just to mark out. We've got uh, five Lola T70s at the top of the yeah. field, and in sixth place we have another Lola, but the T210, the Tilly Nuttall car uh, that you've just, just mentioned. That's fought its way through the field. You mentioned Graham Bryant there. I don't think Graham races this T70 with his son at all, actually. No, Maybe this one on the side. I'd he may well have done. I'm sure I'll see them in, a, in about four weeks' time at Bentley Drivers Club meeting, which they're great supporters of. Uh, and that's one thing I love to see with these uh, some of these historic gentlemen drivers, for want of a better phrase. Uh, they don't just do the big ones, Le Mans Classic, they come and support club races as well. Yeah. And at that, they'll be racing their Morgan Plus 8 that uh, Graham Bryant has owned from brand new. Ah. With the most fantastic registration, Mog 1. Lovely. Uh, the one driver up the front that we haven't mentioned is uh, in the number 70. 70 for a T70. Uh, the uh, French driver with the name of France. So... Uh, he is Pierre Alain France. He's definitely at the wheel. Saw him sitting there before the start. Oh, the 68 one getting a bit wiggly. That's the uh, Philippe and Anton Van Dom. There's lots of these Lola T70s in this event. Yeah, as are our Chevron uh, B19s. There's a yeah. gang of those together um, uh, in about uh, 15, 12, 15th place. But there's uh, five together. All from 1971, the B19. It's uh, Siegfried and Mazzaloni leading that pack of five, and they're all pretty evenly spaced, as you imagine. The fact about, uh, oh, about three, less than a second covering the first three, then it dropped for four, then it's, uh, uh, but actually, no, less than that, just a, a second and a half covering five of the B19s a little bit further down the field. But certainly leading the um, the class is the uh, Tilly Nuttall car. He's just passed Tony Siler, actually, so. Kyle Tilly, a guy who uh, raced in Britain, uh, was managed by Rick Gorn, I believe. And uh, Rick said, the only way you're going to make it is you've got to get yourself out to America. He did that, did quite a lot of coaching. Suddenly found a bit, one of the people he coached, Dwight Merriman, huge in the Silicon Valley business. And uh, Dwight set up uh, for the era team, which has run so successfully in America in uh, LMP2. and. Uh, Kyle is literally living the dream, but certainly living the dream here in that white car with the orange. I never understand why, if you're not sponsored by Martini, you actually paint your car in Martini colours. I suppose it's homage to a great brand and homage to some great racing cars. But uh, it's, it's entirely evocative of the time, uh, isn't it? We, we all know what it means. Yeah, I got a bloke that parks down the road from me in a, a 1600 Escort, and it's in full Martini colours, complete with the bag. You can buy the kits, of course. Nothing wrong with that. Right, so I think there's a lot wrong with it, but never mind. Uh, so Bryant has now pulled out two and a half seconds from uh, David Hart. Um, it's a yellow flag currently at uh, post 29. And I, I'm just looking at... Coming up to the full chicane, isn't it? Yeah. That is, yeah. 29, 30, the, 31, uh, 32 hit, hit. being the two parts of the full chicane on the Marshall post there. Fastest sector set aside by... Um, Ollie Bryant on that first but sector one, he did a 40.5 yeah. and then a, 40, a 97. They're pretty well matched, aren't they, uh, David Hart and uh, Bryant? And uh, the pit window is going to be at 13.39. Um, one car missing from this, of course, is the LRA Lopez T17, expected to be in the mix, which I think had uh, some problems in one of the earlier races. Now, we mentioned the double-waved yellow at... Uh, or double yellow flag at Marshall Post 29 and 30, which has actually just gone off the screen. So I was just going to say, I'm not sure what that was for, but it just is now uh, somewhat uh, uh, academic as uh, that has now just been taken in. So we've gone back to a full course uh, green. Pitch window will open at 13, 39 and 37 seconds. Precisely. We'll at 13, 54 and 37 seconds. Yeah, so um, Bryant and Hart trading purple sector time. See, in this current lap, uh, Ollie Bryant fastest in the first sector. Um, David Hart fastest in the second sector, which is twice as long as the first. It's almost a minute sec a minute and a half sector, which I think takes them uh, down the Mulsanne straight, that sector. Now, we were mentioning about these cars earlier, some of the D-types that doing 
uh, approximately, they were a fraction over, but call it five minute laps. Uh, Ollie Bryant doing 4 minutes 15.5 is his yeah. fastest lap of the race. Now, the pit window opens at 13, 39 and 37 seconds precisely and 54, 37 to close is a 15 minute pit window. So that's going to allow them approximately three laps of running uh, at this pace to get into the, into the pits, which is a, a little bit easier than some of the cars we've seen earlier. Some of the Plateau 1 cars are running 6, 6 minute 30 laps. So uh, uh, you don't get much of an opportunity there. So a little bit more leeway to be a little bit more flexible uh, with your strategy for these cars. Pretty sure their helmet has expired. In, uh, and of course, when you stand by that car, you, you, you smell the, the, the jet fuel burning. It's, it, it's an interesting thing to, to look at and, and even smell, to be honest. Now, BRDC badge on the side of the Bryant car. And uh, in that uh, blue and red colour scheme, I'm not sure where that comes from. It's Valvoline on the side of it, maybe original Valvoline sponsorship there, the big American uh, oil giant, sponsored a lot of racing over the years. Brian again, fastest in sector one, just looking down the field. At, um, I've, another for, ex Formula One driver in this race, actually, is uh, Paul Belmondo. Um, he is definitely at the wheel of another Lola T70, that's the 68 car, Paul Belmondo. Son of one of the most famous act French actors of all time. Uh, did do a couple of seasons of Formula One racing, quite a lot of Le Mans. Uh, never hugely successful. Difficult being the son of one of the most famous. I mean, it was like being the son of Elvis Presley, the son of Elton John. I wouldn't know. Um, I, don't, I don't mix in those circles. You don't mix. Know. But anyway. Um, Belmondo um, once a, a TV broadcast about 15 years ago um, when we were on air with the, the Speed Channel launched into a, what I can only describe as a foul mouth rant. And there was a lot of bleeping, well, they were a bit late on the bleep, I can tell you. Um, anyway, Meanwhile, back here at bye. Le Sard, we have uh, Ollie Bryant, the, um, I would say, professional historic race driver these days. I don't think I mind me oh. using that terminology. 28 minutes left on the clock, as exactly as I speak. Ollie Bryant is, has a 4.26 second lead oh. over David Hart. I think it was David Hart that uh, started the it car. It was, I saw but... David in the car. Okay. Um, there's a Filippo Netti uh, Lola, the Swiss team. Ran a lot of cars over the years, did Filippo Netti. There is a beautiful Mark IV recreated by Carcraft, the uh, number two machine. And, uh, well, that's the number two machine. That's the Robert Kaufman car. Which yeah. is the... Oh, that's, that's the original. That is the original winner. That is not yeah, a just, replica. That's what I was saying. That's not a no, replica. Don't, that's don't the original. Don't a major, major disservice there. That's the 1966 Le Mans winner, yeah. of course. Unbelievable uh, to see it here racing. And uh, Robert, very successful businessman in the States. It's uh, part of Ganassi Racing. Uh, has raced here in, in uh, about 10 years ago in a Ferrari with the AF Corsa. A man lucky enough to own not one, but two of the original Le Mans winners, the 1934 yeah. Alfa Romeo. Which broke down, didn't it, in our uh, Plateau One race? And indeed, this 1966. The car famous for uh, obviously the film now, Ford versus Ferrari, or Le Mans 1966, yeah. depending which side of the Atlantic uh, you've watched the film. Uh, of course, that is the car that you see win it at the very end uh, when you thought Ken Miles and Denny Holm were going to win it. Well, it's that car that did it. Yeah, well, they say that uh, Ken Miles was stitched up, and he probably was. Oh, they, look at that, the 917 Cows and Two. It was a martini sponsorship, you know. Uh, and for some reason, they didn't want the third car to... You'll see a martini sticker on the back. There it is. Uh, that livery later was seen at Watkins Glen on a different car. And that car became a shell car for a bit. What was the strap line martini? Any time, any place, anywhere, wasn't yeah, well, it? Well, yeah. And you mentioned the martini terrace yesterday. Yes. I remember being up Back there. In the Haymarket in London. Yeah. Where their offices were. Launched at... Launched a Lotus Grand Prix car. I think it might have been the Lotus 88 up there. I'm not sure it's launched a Grand Prix car from the yeah, car was, the, car was, the car was downstairs oh, on okay. the road because okay. they had to get permission. I just wanted to, to clarify for that. Yeah, yeah, well, they didn't, yeah. they couldn't get it up there, no. <laughs> um, but doesn't that look just magnificent? And that colour scheme, the, the white was added at the last minute. 
I know this because I've written an article about it recently for the BRDC Bulletin. Meanwhile, let's go to the front. Ollie Bryant controlling uh, this race now. He's pulled out some 11 seconds. Well, uh, uh, David, we haven't seen it, have we? David Hart has made a pit stop. Well, that's and... then, because the pit window doesn't open for another 10 minutes. Well, OK, yeah, he's made a pit stop. He must have a problem. Pit window opens at 13.39. Ah. Oh, and... My, he, apologies, uh, my apologies, totally misleading information. Yeah. Nowhere. We're 13.42 yeah. now, so we are three minutes into the pit window. Sorry, the absolutely my fault. FVC engine on this ex-Guy Edwards car. Now we've got to go up. Oliver Hart being strapped into the 63 below the T70 that his father David has just uh, egressed from. David is sitting outside with his lid off already, looking very calm. Very serious family races these. And, uh, oh, we've we got, got a fire here with the 14. And it, uh, that's going to could be... Below the good. T210 yeah. of uh, Pierre Oliver Calandini. Well, that's going to slow everything up, isn't it? Well, it's certainly going to be a slow zone past that. And, and, and you, you're, in, you're in at the right time now. If they've started the slow zone, this just could change the order around a little bit. There's the team, team Gunston. That was all to do with Gunston's uh, tobacco brand in uh, South Africa. And uh, the, you heard of the Kyle Army 9 hours, which is running again now. Big sports car series, the Springbok series there. And people took cars out there and found local sponsorship. That sponsorship stuck onto that car. That's rather great. They also sponsored, you know, South Africa had its own Formula One championship, which turned out to be a big big battle of the brands, Lucky Strike and Gunston Tobacco Brand. John Love was the Gunston driver. I think he had raced that car as well. He was the Rhodesian, now I should say, to Barbie, um, one of the big stars. So we've gone to safety car for uh, this. Now that's going to change the complexion of the race entirely, as you suspected, uh, Andrew, that uh, it's going to bunch everything up in terms of pit stops. So we are... Uh, we've got four minutes left of the pit window being yeah. open, but of course, technically, you can't. Uh, uh, can you pit stop under the safety I car? I think you can. I think but you've got to get round, haven't you? Just a little, basically, Alpine Renault rally car there. And uh, here is the, that's the Mark IV. Yeah, that's the Mark IV. Got a got a gurney tab on the back, which is the, the vertical plate on the rear wing, and it's showing a little bit, a little bit of a witness marks on the right-hand side there. It's beautifully painted like the rest of the car in that gorgeous mid-metallic blue, and the, the right-hand yeah. side of that gurney that, tab is, is, fold, is folded forward, that, where it's creased the paint off. So we've got uh, uh, the, this uh, car. The pompiers which, have gone to, into action. Yeah, that that uh, Mark IV is one of the car craft recreations owned by an American family. Three brothers share it actually. And uh, there's again the guns. Are, well, are they? Are these cars stuck in the? Pit I, I just I love, I love it. Safety, safety cars out with these lights on the front. Well, that's while well, it just collects them all up. But there's uh, more than one safety car out on the track. Obviously, I, lo I love the detail. The 76, below the T212 of uh, uh, Christophe Boudon uh, is in the pits, and just uh, we just saw a, a close-up from our cameraman. Yeah. Great camera shot of uh, the door being shut. Now it's an open car, and you fold the door down. But yeah. the, the mechanic reached inside to do the catch because there is no catch on the outside. Because yeah. Why do you need it? It's safe. It's it's a, a, another part you don't need, and it can go wrong. Yeah. Aerodynamics, etc. That detail in racing cars, I just love it. Lovely Daytona here. Look at the, well, I suppose the shell colours. Cap yeah, we've got Capri's RS 2600 Capri's in this. It's the, the number 15 machine of uh, Simon Evans and well-known historic racer Joe Twyman. Now the order has changed back a little bit because we are under safety car at the moment because of a. Uh, car that's uh, ostensibly on fire on, I think it's on the Mulsanne straight. Yeah, it's definitely on the Mulsanne. So now these people can't get out. Okay, so I was just, just going to say, so we have three lower T70s at the front, Bryant, Brooks and France. Yes. Now, this is potentially yeah, this, this compromised is, David uh, and Oliver, Oliver Hart. Absolutely has, yes. Because they, they has. pitted already uh, in their number 63 T70 entry, but the cars that he held at the end of the pit lane, this was my question of, whether you can or cannot pit under a safety car. Well, safety car under normal racing gives you the opportunity, uh, basically, not free time, but re vastly reduced time. If you can get in at exactly the right moment and get a tire, tire change uh, here's the and then re car. Rejoin, rejoin the crocodile, then that's great. But when you, when you come into the pits already, what they've done here is the organizers, they've got a yellow flag at the end of the pit lane. And what they do is they're holding the cars in the pit lane. So that's going to put them 
Is it going to put them a lap down? Is it not? Are they going to join into the correct part of the crocodile on the safety car? I'm sure the organisers, as ever, are all over it, uh, as, they, as they will be, and they'll get the cars released to exactly uh, the right point. But at the moment, as it stands, our timing screen reads, low the T70s, one, two and three, rounding out the podium, podium and that's uh, Ollie Bryant currently leading them. Uh, he has completed five laps, and uh, his fastest lap of the race so far, it's uh, the last minute, four minute 55. Yeah. They were doing quicker than that. That is the Bryant car. So the Bryant car is in the pits? Yeah, the Bryant car is caught in the pits. So that's, that's destroyed his race, I would have thought. Needless. Well, it just, it just depends on how how the organisers shuffle yeah. the safety cars. So uh, they've got the uh, RF sign in the car with the, uh, the safety car sitting there, uh, warning everybody. So that uh, that literally tells you within the car it's, it's gone to safety car. If you're at the right part of the track, you uh, can dive into the pits. Yeah, I guess they're waiting for, for the safety car. Got, um, we haven't seen it on the track. We've got a full... We've seen two of them. There's, yeah. two, there's two of them out on the two, track, so yeah. the BMW M, uh, M4 yeah, we have. That's right. out yeah. on track. Yeah. So what they should do is, uh, in, in theory, it doesn't always apply, but in theory, in my understanding of it, I could be completely wrong, each race can be slightly different, and each organiser has a different set of regulations uh, depending on the type of racing. But what would probably happen is that you would want to have those cars released back onto the track, go behind the appropriate yeah. safety car, Steve, and then reshuffle the order as they should Steve be. Steve Brooks is having to come in now, having not pitted. Yeah. So way by, basically, for them. Yeah. Uh, Chevron B8 there of uh, our entry number okay. 85. Good proportion car, the Chevron B8. So here is the Exit Taylor car coming in, as I mentioned. It's got a list of all the people who have driven it on the other side of the car. So Probably goes beyond the bottom but, of the uh, door on that car, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, but Brian Redmond, perhaps the, the best known. Brian Redmond here this weekend. I believe he did, did one race earlier on uh, yesterday evening. So here we are under this yellow, following the fire on the Mulsanne Strait, which has uh, just now, tipped up the whole race, hasn't it, really? We're yeah, we're just coming up to uh, time is 13.50 in a few seconds. Yeah, so that, gives us, that gives us uh, four minutes and 37 seconds remaining of the pit window open. But of course, we've got uh, all these, these groups. Well, we've got two different yeah. batches here. The, um, so one of the T70s, one of the lesser, can I say that, lesser T70s of that uh, in the number 60 car, he hasn't stopped. And a GT40, Schwartz and Schwartz, that has got Everyone else has stopped. Now, the car's being released from the end of the pit lane while still under safety car. This is, this is critical to the race as to what happens now. So the car that was on fire has been has been extinguished. This there was a flatbed lorry there, just going to recover that now, so we need to get that out of the way. Yeah. But most importantly for the race order now and for our race leading car that was before it went out, uh, the 64 car of Oliver Bryant. The safety car is still on, alive on track, so we're still under safety car rules, but the pit lane exit has now been opened, so these cars can catch up with their appropriate crocodile. Yeah, the key exactly. phrase here now is wave by. Who gets weighed by, who doesn't, yeah. how do we reshuffle the order to as it was before the incident? Which is what we should do in fairness and equity, that's what we should be doing. Whether we do it, we haven't seen this situation here. Precisely, all un last unprecedented year, ground here. All last year, so... So that Alpine leads the group. And behind the, the course car, quite a lot of cars that way down the order. Bit of weaving going on to keep the temperature up in the tyres. And the the car that actually is the front, it's the Alpine A220 from 1969. Three litre V8 car with the Gerard Besson and Jean Francois Besson are the listed drivers for that. The uh, the Cowson uh, hippie car is now it held yeah, up. Just, I'm trying well, they to, I'm closed trying it again. I'm just trying to speculate here around just to what was going on there. I was just about to say. Well, I saw a picture and I thought that Bryant was just about to pull out and had to stop. So it'd be nice to see the front of it, see whether he got out or not. But so the pit lane exit is closed once again. Now, this may well be uh, absolute superlative organisation 
uh, by Peter Alto and the crew and the staff and the team there of holding this group until the, cause we've got two safety cars out on track. Uh, maybe just getting them all lined up together so we can emerge the two safety cars and get the field back into the running order it was before that safety car was applied. There's 15, 20 cars held up in the pit lane at the moment. So uh, the howlet is there, uh, yeah. humming, humming away, expect, sounding yeah. like a helicopter because it's got the engine from a helicopter. And uh, did race in period in the UK in the Boac uh, Thousand. Um, one of the drivers we could hear it. Look. BOAC, as in the British Overseas Air Corporation, that became British Airways. And a BOAC pilot called Hugh Dibley drove the car. He was very happy to I remember right, he was the main driver. It was a McKee chassis. McKee were best known for building Formula Vs and Super Vs, but they built the chassis for this. So one of the cars that appears not to be rejoining is our number eight uh, 365 GTB4 uh, Ferrari, I, a Daytona to the rest of the world, 4.3 litre, 4.4 litre, almost V12. Christopher Stahl uh, from uh, Germany at the wheel of that car. Maroon, uh, a rare colour to see on a, a Ferrari of that era, actually, let alone on, on a Daytona. Uh, nice to see something a little bit different. Uh, a wine red uh, Ferrari Daytona, or 365 GTB4 to give it its proper terminology. Yeah. Peter, a year ago, we had the T70 of Nick Sleep and Alec Montgomery winning this race by 13 seconds from Henry Fletcher in a Chevron B19. Um, uh, Tony Seiler and, and so on were, were competitors a year ago. Um, well, we're just ticking into just under 30 minutes of this race uh, left on the clock, Andrew, but that yeah. also leaves us with we are seconds away from our pit window uh, closing. Yeah. Pit windows, no, and it's, not, it's not academic, it's just slightly fluid at the moment as to how we, how we make this all work. But the organisers will be on top of it, and we will, of course, uh, report to yourself, the listeners, uh, that which we see. That's all we can do. Um, but it is, a, it is a little bit of a, a pre unprecedented ground, this one. I think we're breaking new territory here. So the yeah. marshal's working away hard on the Mulzahn straight with, with age old-fashioned brooms and, of course, quick dry and uh, that sort of different uh, on surfaces there. And, of course, a leaf blower to get rid of all, all the stuff on the track there before cars go through that when we go back to full course green racing, which hopefully won't be too far away. Bearing in mind, we have only got 13 minutes left yeah. of this race. Yeah, let's just talk a little bit about the, the Halmet because it's such a fascinating car and, and project. Is it Howmet uh, or Howlet? Uh, Howmet. Uh, Continental TS351 helicopter engine. It's a brainchild of Ray Heppenstall and Bob McKee. And it made its debut at the 1968 Daytona 24 Hours with Dick Thompson, Ed Lowther at the wheel. They had uh, wastegate problems where they raced in the Boac 500. They later won a club race in Alabama with it. It's about the only thing. Right, pit won. exit now being opened again. Andrew, don't find that's such fine to say. Well, their pit exit is still on the safety car, but pit exit now open. So cars are now, the remainder of those 15 or so cars you identified in yep. the pit lane there, they've now been released to come and join their crocodile. Hopefully the two crocodiles will merge uh, and get uh, racing back underway. But it, uh, I think this, at this rate, we're going to have less than 10 minutes of racing. So we've got a view now of one yep. of our safety cars. It's got the, he got the lights back on. Uh, and that's got, uh, which car's that got behind it? That's got the 12 uh, right behind, the Alpine A220 of uh, Gerard Basson and Jean-Francois Besson, the two Besson so brothers, maybe? We, yeah, we've got the Hart car second in that crocodile. And I think they're in a very good situation now because, you know... Yeah, but that's, that's not the accurate running order. But let, let's see what, well, let's let's what see. happens. Just to finish the story with the, um, with the helmet turbine car, they raced here in 1969. They had two cars, Heppenstall and Thompson, and Tullius and the Boac pilot, Hugh Dibley. They had a, a wheel bearing failure, and the other car crashed. But uh, that was their one appearance here. But, um, yeah. One of the last cars in the pits is the number 40. Appropriately, it is a, a GT40, uh, with Christoph Schwartz at the wheel, who's a German, and Mademoiselle Lisa Schwartz, ah. whose nationality is French. Uh, maybe the husband guess, and wife. Well, I'm guessing husband and wife team. That maybe she was a uh, she's French national originally uh, and married married a uh, French uh, a Frenchman a, a German. So well, that car yeah. is still just slightly worryingly yeah. in the pits at the moment. Yeah, he was the last one in, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, so it got. Now, the cars being, as we're approaching this, where, where the car was on fire on the Mulsanne, all the cars being gesticulated across to the left-hand side of the, the, the track, obviously the safety car naturally taking that course over to the left-hand side. Some of the uh, crocodile a little, uh, yeah. a little uh, 
tardy in waiting wanting to do that, but it's all at slow speed until they can see what's actually happened there. They've got, they've got blowers out there to get the, uh, the kitty litter off. And uh, just trying to see, so there's Hart second in the crocodile. Where is Ollie Bryant? A long way back. I think Ollie's got, the way I read it, may not be right, it's, he's got a lot of work to do and he's got, uh, he's got Steve Brooks in front of him as well. Well, if they, if they stay in this order, and I'm not suggesting they can or cannot, I'm just saying, hypothetically, if they do stay in this order, then that has certainly compromised uh, Ollie, Oliver Bryant's race. Yeah, yeah. And uh, play into the hands of the Hearts, who uh, looks as if they were going to... Uh, they had a third and a first, so that, you know, they're, they're odds-on favourites, aren't they, to take the overall... Uh, aggregate victory. That's one of the yeah. favourite phrases of uh, the late great Jerry Marshall, British uh, saloon car racer in period and 600 race winner, 627 I think it was, as he would always say a win's a win. Yep. Absolutely. So that 40 car is still sitting there with the air. Now they're, they're, they're doing something deliberately here Andrew. They've got blowers in the front of that car and I think they're watching and Anticipating where they've got, yes, they're shutting the door now to release it quickly. So they're releasing that car at an exact point. So they know something that we we'll have some information that we're not necessarily privy to to release that number 40 GT40, the Schwarz run car. We think it's husband and wife. It's certainly, uh, yeah, two of them in that car. And they're releasing that now. They've got it to the end of the pit lane, but there's what's the point? Because at the moment, slightly academic, the safety yeah. car's now gone by with that crocodile. Now that's why they've done it, because there's another car at the end of the yeah. pit lane already with a yellow flag. So I still I still say, despite the fact that we're now running into just under nine minutes of this race left, I still think we're going to merge these two safety cars. They've got a dash for cash, maybe, at the end of this, because... It's going to be a one-lap shootout. It is, yeah. Um, I hope not. I don't know if it's more laps it's a shame. than a one-lap yeah. shootout. Yeah. I don't Light. mind a shootout, but I'd like it to be more than one lap. Light's still on. So that Alpine, number 12, which heads the crocodile, is certainly a lap down, isn't it? It's not shown on our first sort of 25 or 30. Chevron B8s, Chevron B19s, B21s. The uh, the chassis, the open chassis just evolved. It had the. It started with the Clubman's car, did uh, Derek Bennett. Go. Built quite a lot of very successful, beautiful looking Formula 3 cars, Formula Atlantic cars. There was a possible Formula 1 car. Um, the chassis never actually raced in Formula 1. There was a bit of a development there. And then there was the sports car line, which went up through the B6, the B8. Right, safety car in this lap, Andrew. Good. Up on our, on our Good. timing screen. So uh, it looks like, uh, when we say safety car, there's two safety cars out there. So it looks like we're not going to merge these two. Well, so we... this is going to play enormously into the hands of David and Oliver Hart. Uh, have we well, seen a second... Crocodile. Well, there were—I haven't no, but there were no. two. Said there were two different colour safety cars. I don't think they pulled one off, do? Potentially so. They might have just might have been. Yeah. Just a, so a lot of people here that are sort of running down in the twenties. But a lot of cars haven't caught up with the. If there is one safety car on the track, which we so haven't there, seen. There's a, is that a Steve Brooks car there, going through. A lot of people have similar colours to the the Team Elite Sid Taylor colours. Um, well, all will be revealed, won't it, in uh, the closing minutes. A little bit of uh, essence into this race. Disappointing, actually, because uh, we had a good battle going on with those T70s. Now, our timing screen still lists uh, uh, Oliver, Ollie Bryant as... Third. In third, some... Uh, 21 seconds adrift. I so Steve Brooks is 18 seconds adrift from our leader Oliver Hart at the moment, and then Oliver Bryant is 21 seconds further down the road. Oh, there. and uh, there's the abandoned. Now we saw that that's car stop. Yeah, out that's just a yeah, just an image of it uh, being abandoned a bit earlier on. Uh, I will uh, I will tempt fate here that if uh, if this result if uh, if we can't go back to full racing soon or I want to see what happens with so the clock has started again safety car yeah, has gone now it didn't go off at the usual place there no but uh, we got racing again which is is great Chevron B16 and 75 car totally caught me by going, surprise yeah. it can off yeah. Ted's rooms that did uh, didn't quite get it right did he in the 75 
So Oliver Hart it is now that just uh, disappears as fast as possible, uh, make, uh, make uh, hay in the sun whilst he can, doesn't matter whether he's meant to be there or not. He's got a 8.7 second lead over Steve Brooks and Oliver Bryant is uh, 29 seconds further adrift. So yeah, that kind 36 of... in total over the race leader. Now is 36 seconds uh, something able to catch up in, in five minutes in a, uh, in a car of equal capacity? I think not. Well, certainly played into the hands of uh, the Dutch, flying Dutch pair. Wonder if we get another Dutch victory in another race today. But that There is Brooks trying to weave his way through all the chevrons. And uh, as you say, he's 8.7 seconds behind. So, but we haven't seen Bright yet. Well, no, he's further out now. There's, uh a loose slippery surface flags being waved on that part of the Mulsanne where uh, they've had all the blowers on to clear out that car that was on fire. Uh, all the extinguishment and uh, uh, material put on the track to do that. It's still there, but obviously it'll just kick up a cloud of dust. So to keep away from the right-hand side of the track to the benefit. Uh, uh, somebody that uh, suffered from that was Kyle Tilly. I remember he was right up uh, best of the uh, two-litre cars and in about eighth place overall. He's dropped down be behind three or four other similar class cars in the TSRC 22 class, whatever that stands for. And here is... Oh, that was a bit of a moment, wasn't he? What uh, I think, there? I, I, th well, I, think, I think Oliver Hart, he was just keeping over to the left-hand side where I mentioned where all yeah. that... Uh, um, material being put down on the track and that put him slightly offline for the next set of curves and he just he just ran a little bit bit wide onto the left-hand side, got himself onto the yeah. loose bit, a bit over the marbles and beyond. The Huntingdon built uh, car designed by Eric Broad Broadley started off as an open car T70 Spider, as you mentioned, got a roof on its head. And being huge, I think the early cars were built in Slough actually before they, they were, the they were yeah. definitely built, yes. Yeah, got a chassis, on the trading chassis, stage chassis, at Slough. chassis number is SL, is the SL, later yeah. ones are HU, that's right, remember that. So, uh, it's still we've still got the top five cars are indeed. Uh, T70s, we did in fact uh, separated now by a chevron of Nelson, Vaggio and Gules has got that self uh, up into sixth place, the B19. That, uh, uh, and then we've got two more Lola T70 Mark 3s of Gaudet and Van Drom and Belmondo, the car you mentioned. Yeah, Paul Belmondo. Car. Um, well, I suppose that was about the best part of 10 minutes, wasn't it, under what in America we would call a full course yellow. So it's now, now we've gone across the line, it's now evened out the gap for us. Uh, Andrew, so uh, the Oliver driven, Oliver Hart driven T70 now has a 15.7 lead, uh, second lead over Steve Brooks, who in turn, Ollie Bryant, uh, has brought the car that was leading before the safety car uh, procedure. Uh, he's now down from 27 seconds to 22, so he's found five seconds on that lap. Uh, it's not the, f not the fastest car, interesting enough, the three Lolas at the front. A five minute 17 for Oliver Hart, a five minute 13 for Steve Brooks, and a 5.24 for Oliver Bryant. I have to say, I've never seen Steve go this quickly in a T70. He must really suit this Le Mans track. There are two Steve Brooks, actually. There's a Frenchman that races under the name Steve Brooks as a pseudonym. And it mustn't get them mixed up. This is the real Steve Brooks. And uh, here is coming through the heat haze. Brooks with the Lola T70, those classic colours. So we're on to the final lap. That uh, Monaco has just come up, legends come up on our timing screen. It is, this is it. One minute uh, 45 yep. on the clock, but of course that's, it's going to be, I'd be very surprised if it's not a win for the uh, green 63 number T70 of father and son, David and Oliver Hart. Seven laps completed. Uh, I haven't set the fastest lap of the race by a long margin. As you say, Steve Brooks, that five minute 13 on that last lap, lap rotation. And a good run, it must have gone very well, it just got in the right place and got out of the pits before that yellow, Tony Seiler. Ollie Bryant, point. Oliver Bryant still not giving up there though. Um, Andrew still fighting his way through, he is going yeah, to be third pushing. on the podium, final step of the podium, but uh, a small consolation for a man that uh, aced this and absolutely bossed this race and the safety yeah. car just, just worked against him and it, it can happen that way, but uh, it's going to be Oliver Hart at the moment bringing his father, I'm going to say it's his father's car, maybe it's his car, let's, uh, not, let's not assume David owns them all. I think he probably does dark green with the black stripes, unusual livery of this uh, T70 with the Chevrolet engine pounding away in the background. 
Uh, Some, something David Hart does with his DH, DHG group uh, yeah. is, is they, he does like, unless he has to run a, a period uh, livery, he does like something a little bit quirky. We saw yeah. uh, some of the Endurance Legend stuff yesterday where it was Again, he's on, he's on the limit here. He's twitching there into the corner. He's not, he, hopefully he's not going to throw it away, young Oliver, is he? No, I don't think he is. And that's, uh, it's, it's quite, it, quite conditional because it's quite... I don't know what the ambient temperature is out there. It's got to be 20... 23, 24 degrees, I'd have thought, 21 degrees. Okay, I'm not too far out. Nope. Always oversold a little bit, under-delivered, there you go. Uh, yep. But he's uh, Oliver Hart there. He's going to come through the four chicanes for the final time. It's the it's the left, the right. One more left. They're coming down the short straight, past the pit entrance. The first part of that four chicane, still heavy under the braking car, snaking away there, left and right. One more, left and right. He's going to come, right and left, sorry. He's going to come <laughs> through. Uh, yeah, the Flying Dutchman take a victory here in the Alola T70 and they win it overall, having had a second, a first, and now another first. So, very good day for them, or two days for them, in fact. Steve Brooks will finish in second place in his original Sid Taylor racing car in its such iconic colour scheme. Yeah, so the Chevron in front crossing the line, that's, that's a, a lap down. That's got another lap to complete. Uh, where's Ollie? There's the... Uh, Hart crew, there's just a quick shot of uh, David or David Hart. Um, the sponsorship from Hamlin Books, they had Imperial still on the car. Here is uh, Bryant in the uh, Valverine livered machine, goes past Rob Kaufman and uh, will come home in third place. Be a bit frustrated, I think, Ollie, because that would have been a battle all the way to the flag had it not been for that full course yellow. And then next up should be the veteran Swiss driver, Tony Seiler. Yeah, that was actually the GT. That was the other mark for, for yeah. of uh, Charles Dolan, Brian. Charles, Brian and Peter Dolan, uh, not the Rob Kaufman one. And um, Steve Brooks will take second place overall on the aggregate because he had a first and a fourth. And the people around him didn't have very good... Uh, we didn't see much of Pirro in that race, did we? And Hugenholz in there. GT40 it was obviously not quite as, as quick as the other cars. I'm sure why they weren't in the T70. Here is the, the marvellous colour scheme, one of the greatest colour schemes of all time. But with the Martini logos on, as I said. And, uh, just wonderful piece of engine. I don't know if you've ever looked at one of those, Peter, with the bodywork off, you wouldn't like to put your feet where they had to put theirs. Well, I think, yeah. I, I think the, the space frame of a, a Porsche 917 uh, in period weighed 45 kilos. Yes. Is my yeah. understanding, but yeah. which is, is, is and, quite uh, big. Exact, Sa safety was not a concern yeah, in those days. Xavier Micheron, the helmet with its Cortina GT rear lights uh, comes to the uh, finish, so he got it home last year. It's actually year. known as the CND tail lights, which is yes. very appropriate in the 1960s, yeah. yes. And so that's our Plateau 5, 1966-71 yeah. cars. That's our final uh, run of that. And, of course... I'm, where, where Oliver Bryant's finish in that is, is Andrew, you've done the maths for all three of these. This is the yeah. culmination of all three. So we've had the race on Saturday, the race at night. Yeah. Uh, just very quickly, can you work out where that is for us, or do we need to come well, back to you on that one? No, no. So Hart will win it easily yeah. with a second, uh, with a third and a first and a first. And definitely Steve Brooks will be second. But the critical question is, had Oliver oh, Bryant had won it, it yeah, would it have affected Hart winning it overall? Absolutely not. He, fine. He, he, he stopped on the, the Well, it's probably race. not fine, because you don't want to win a race, no, don't no, you? No, uh, but, um, but no, but overall, he, 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 he didn't have a result in one of the three no, races. we've got, got something uh, I think I've just seen as uh, we look at the number three uh, hippie 917 coming through the final chicanes. Uh, I think I saw something in, in the gravel on the left-hand side, not the, the first part of it, uh, unless my eye deceived <laughs> me. Uh, which is uh, not something to happen on, on the last lap, but uh, we, I'm sure we'll, we'll get a, a second sight of that in a minute. So can't quite see it from our commentary position, a little bit too far away with grandstands and buildings in the way. So a somewhat, uh, somewhat different race there for the uh, final grid of the Plateau 5. Uh, safety car uh, can work with you and work away, as John said yesterday, it giveth and it taketh away. Uh, yeah, we have got a driver at the side of the track there, so I think I'm right about that car. That uh, there's a car gone off onto 
into the gravel there on the left-hand side. The first part of the uh, the Ford chicane coming out after the Porsche curve. So uh, my point being there, actually looked like it was a little bit damaged, or it might just be bodywork that's come off it. Uh, but it's another car to clear away before we start uh, Plateau 6. Or we, I think we've got things in between that as well. But safety car, as John said yesterday, uh, all circuits, but big circuits like this, Le Mans and Nürburgring, I think, are notorious for it. They giveth and they taketh away. So let's just see some highlights of this race. So, um, start of the race, it was a lower, lower o'clock, I was going to say, for the start, start of uh, this Plateau 5 race. One, two, three, four, five, got a little, little separate Lola in there, the little T212 uh, uh, first, that made its way there. GT40s fighting their way out, all clean and tidy up to uh, the Dunlop. Okay, one the uh, Ford Mark. Falls there. I think that's the Rob Cavan car was going very slowly. Initially, it settled down in order to um, David Hart, Rob, uh, uh, Robert Brooks, there's a pass in the past, Steve Brooks and Oliver Bryant. But very soon, the one of Ferrari Daytona is there, the 365 number 32, getting a little out of shape, whereas Eman Quell, who you had done earlier on, Lister uh, at one of the Mulsanne chicanes, had to fight his way through the tyres and missing everything. It was soon uh, Oliver Bryant in the 64 car up into the lead, diving down the inside of David Hart at the end of the lap. And uh, Brooks had Steve Brooks had a little look as well, nearly became uh, first to third place for uh, David Hart. It didn't quite happen. We then had a car fire on the Molson, somewhat dramatically. Driver absolutely OK, but of course, Marshall's having to attend to that and get uh, that extinguished and whatever. And that just took us very quickly into what we thought we knew would be a yellow zone, a yellow flag, then a safety, uh, then a safety car evolved. And this is where it all started to change the face of the race uh, completely. But uh, once we had a restart again, and it was uh, uncontestable, driver change there for David Hart, across to his son, Oliver Hart, into the T70, taking the flag in the 63, dark green, low the T70. And they were first, second, third, fourth, and fifth uh, with Father and son, David and Oliver Hart taking the top step of the podium. Steve Brooks in second place and Oliver Bryant, uh, I'm going to say a consolation prize because I'm sure that's what it feels like for him having uh, uh, got to the front of that race on, on a hard-earned drive as ever, uh, taking the final step of the podium on our 1966 to 1971 Plateau 5 grid, the final Plateau 5 uh, of the weekend. That, of course, gives overall honours to uh, David and Oliver Hart. They've having one on the accumulator, if you like, the successful results all the way through the race. All the way through the weekend, my apologies. Thank you, gentlemen. And just one more 43 minute race to go, and that will be for our newest cars. Quite a broad spectrum here as we move into 1972 and stretch it to our youngest cars uh, in this celebration of 100 years of the Le Mans 24 hours here at the Classic for 2023. Uh, 1981 is the cut-off date. Uh, thank you to all of you who have been uh, tweeting in at RSL underscore studio. Very, very sticky outside, although the humidity has dropped down to just 47%. It's 22 in the air, 33 on the track. Doesn't need to be any warmer than that for these tyres. The class winners just going through for our final of grid five. We've got fantastic cars coming up again with the final grid six event coming up. Our final broadcast live from Le Mans 2023. It's the Le Mans Classic. We've cleared the last plateau, and now we move on to grid number six. And these are the newest cars, the 
Age range is from 1972 to 1981. The BMW dark blue with the BMW Motorsport stripes, number 65, which is going to be driven by Vanina X, among others, this weekend. The three litre, 3.5 actually. Let's hear what she had to say this weekend earlier on. Vanina X. Mais c'est un peu une surprise de vous voir quand même ici. Laurent saying he bit of a surprise to see her at the circuit this weekend. Il y avait une famille maintenant, qu'il y avait d'autres d'autres horizons peut-être. Qu'est-ce qui fait que vous revenez alors en classique Oui, c'est une surprise pour moi aussi, mais un grand plaisir surtout. J'ai enfin l'âge de participer aux courses historiques. Et comme le, la pratique complete, du sport automobile est plus compliquée à mettre en action que, que d'aller jouer une partie de tennis. Uh, often quite ma vie est aujourd'hui loin des circuits et c'est toujours un plaisir de pouvoir y revenir, mais c'est rare effectivement. Et alors donc, qu'est-ce que vous allez euh, piloter Avec quoi allez-vous regoûter au sport auto Alors j'ai été invité par mon ami driving. Bern Georgi pour rouler sur euh, une BMW CSL de 1975. Je suis curieux de la découvrir parce que je ne la connais pas cette voiture et de remonter sur ce circuit. Good car for this circuit. Puis-je profiter de votre présence pour que vous me donniez éventuellement votre regard sur les femmes dans le sport auto Est-ce que vous voyez une évolution par rapport à quand vous étiez en activité Est-ce que vous avez un jugement à porter à ce niveau-là Oui, il y a une évolution, heureusement, et je suis ravi de la suivre, même si elle est un peu tardive. Unfortunately. Les femmes pilotes étaient rares. Il y en avait une ou deux par Revelation, but there is change coming, she says. Championnat. Très rare étaient celles qui s'engageaient vers la monoplace, d'où l'absence de femmes en Formule 1. Wasn't the opportunity for single seat driving when she was coming up through her career. Gagner des courses IndyCar. Ce que je remarque aujourd'hui, c'est que pour la première fois, on confie aux femmes des voitures performantes, des voitures pour gagner. Good to see women now getting the opportunity in cars that can take victories. And it can't be too long before we see a woman winning the Le Mans. Magnifique. C'était une très belle course pour notre équipe belge et aussi une très belle course pour la boucle de la Merci, Vanina. Good to see Vanina back and back in a car, in a beautiful car as well, Peter, for our fan. Now, I would submit to the court, um, and I have a BMW motorbike that doesn't have the stripes on, but no BMW bike or car has been made any the less, has been spoiled by the addition of BMW Motorsport or Motorrad stripes. Dark colours, light colours, the two colours of blue and the red just seem to work on anything. It's just a canvas that works so well, it's isn't amazing, it? It's amazing, isn't it? Any, as you say, any colours, Gersa beer, uh, other brands are available, Jägermeister, things on orange, blue, etc. It doesn't matter. And you've got me talking about a BMW when there's an Aston Martin on screen. You've done a great job there, John. Very impressive. I just thought I'd get you out of the way. <laughs> this is not just any Aston Proud, Martin. Proudly wearing its Aston Martin Owners Club badge uh, of front of centre, as it should be. As it did in period. This is the number eight car, the RHA M1. Uh, Paul Chasse Gardner, um, uh, Paul Chase Gardner, um, 5.340, uh, 5.3 engine V8. Of course, very interesting history on that car. Yeah, RHAM, Robin Hamilton, Aston Martin, uh, the car, the guy found. He was a, he wasn't a dealer, but he was a preparer. Uh, in period at the time, back in the, in the 60s and 70s, uh, very famously raced a DB4 GT1 GRE, which is now owned and run by, well, it's actually it's owned by Wolfgang Friedrichs, and I'll come back to who it's run by in a minute. But uh, uh, he had this idea that Aston Martin should go back to Le Mans. We'd had, we mentioned this earlier, didn't we? And we had the, uh, the 60s cars, early 60s cars, that the French dealers wanted Aston Martin to run to the project cars. That had its natural life for a short while. Then they did pull out of it early 60s, 63, 64. They went into private hands. And by 77, Robin Hamilton was developing this car in club racing, as he did in those days, and thought, well, it's going quite well in club racing, but I fancy a bit of a bigger challenge. Where are you going to go from club racing? Well, of course, it's obvious you go to... Le Mans, don't you? <laughs> you take your club race driver with you, who's a, a rallycross champion, no less than Dave Fries, and a dentist by, by day. Uh, but you, of course, you, you employ uh, and pay for the services of somebody like Mike Salmon, 
uh, drove that car originally at Le Mans uh, back in 1977. What do they do? They put it into they, they requested a change of class because it wasn't the the right class for the car, and it got here, and it uh, it went to the GTP class and finished a staggering. 17th overall. Now, to say it finished was something quite special. We're talking pre-Chicane, Mulsanne Chicanes in those days, back in 1977. Uh, and a fabulous effort it was. And I think it sort of kind of rekindled a bit of Aston Martin stuff. Robin Hamilton went on then to uh, obviously be involved in Nimrod, the Group C car, uh, which is also run by uh, uh, Richard Williams, that sadly departed last year with us, one of the, one of the great Aston Martin developers. But who was Robin Hamilton's right-hand man at Robin Hamilton? racing it was a guy called dave jack dave jack now runs a company called aston engineering yeah what car is he running this year the same car that car yeah. so he ran he worked on that car in period in 1977 so 45 46 years later uh, he's here running this exactly the same car for its uh, its current owner paul chase gardner uh, and that car would you believe it is running its original 77 Le Mans engine. Of course it is. It's been in storage, it's been looked after, it's been rebuilt, it never caused a problem. Affectionately known, last words on it very quickly, affectionately known as the Muncher, because it, it destroyed brake discs, which was a problem. It just ate them, so they nicknamed it the Muncher. Got a Capri RS 2600 here, up to Townsend across from New Zealand with that car. And Moine uh, LM75 from 1975, that's a, a two litre car, Alain Boit and Pierre Boit. Uh, driving those couple of 296 um, Lola's the BMW M1 Pro cars are with us now these are three and a half litre in line six um, brilliant cars uh, Ligier SGS2 V8 3 litre K3 turbos and 930 turbos from Porsche one of the smaller grids this and the Inaltera from 1977 uh, 3 litre V8 here as well, that's an interesting car. And also, Alistair McCaig running the Decadenay from 1977, plus a Macella as well, a two litre car. March 75 S is in there as well. Chevron B21, Carlos Tavares, who's the man at the head of the Stellantis Motor Group. He's the big boss. Indeed, Alistair McCaig, uh, the head of the, the old Curia Cost team that we mentioned before, that's still, still going, that uh, gave. Uh, Jim Clark, he's big, he's big break. My personal favourite here, which will shock you, tough one, between the Mirage M6, and I think it might be the Datsun 240Z Group 4, because you just don't see them, do you? Mind then again, the Capri, oh heavens, having raced a Capri a few times, albeit an RS 3.1 and not in the kind of spec of this stunning blue and white car. That's a Mark II, isn't it, with those lights? John, quite apart from work, we have many shared passions uh, in, in, into the greater detail of these cars. I didn't realise how serious you were about your Capris. I am too, but of course it was my first race car was a Capri. Uh, so uh, here's a proposition for us, anybody listening out there. Commentator car, John Hindoff, Peter Snowden in a Capri. Somewhere. Somewhere. Somewhere, Two driver, anywhere, somewhere anywhere is fine. So 1972 to 1981. Andrew, this is the last race. How do we stand here? Who are we looking out for? Well, we've got a big bit of needle in this one. Maxime Gennet, or Max as he calls himself in the Lola 286, won the first race after colliding, battling for the lead with Eve Shamama. Okay. Shamama broke the wishbone on the Tosh, the York Obermeiser, uh, Obermeier design car. In the second race, Shamama won, and Max was second. And uh, just had a quick word with uh, Eve, uh, and he's not happy. So, also we got other intrigue in here because we've got uh, Chris McAllister in the marvellous Golf Mirage, had problems in the first race and was much quicker in the second. And then we've got Alistair McCaig in the third generation Decadene Lola, which uh, finished fourth in the second race, had brake problems in the first, so uh, I retired. That, that car just finished 10 days ago, just had one little run uh, under the uh, aegis of, of Chris Fox Racing. Uh, Donington did a few laps there, come here, and the car is super competitive. Never rule out Henry Fletcher in the Chevron B26, man who has won uh, the B class effectively of the his Masters Historic Formula One. In Altera going, sorry, Andrew. Yeah, so, going uh, out this, this, the car we mentioned earlier on. This is uh, Edwin Stuckey from Switzerland, Ludo 
Jolly and Frederick Yelly, two Frenchmen there. This is V8, a three litre V8. I came in and you were talking about BMWs. Yeah. Were you talking about Prince Leopold von Bayern? I wasn't. Prince Le Leopold von Bayern is in the car that I think was it 30 years, 40 go, years ago. He raced here, and the same three drivers are in the same car they raced here in the same it's colour scheme. Uh, I'll find it in a minute for you. And um, Prince Leopold uh, is actually 80 years old, but he's going to be taking oh. part in this. And uh, it, it was a factory car, because Prince Leopold is still a BMW ambassador to this day. Excellent. Um, and what a story. But uh, they had a big press conference, actually. Oh, the Crown Racing car raced in period by Chris Kraft and won the European... Sorry, which one talking about now? I'm talking about... Well, I just... No, that just stopped on the track. It's which a crown, crown Racing. Um, didn't catch the number of it. One of the leading Lolas. Um, OK. That, that, so let's just get to the... Um, the BMW Pro cars, quite a lot in this, aren't there? Um, it's the number 27 we're going to be looking for. Uh, Leopold von Bayern, the Prince, Gen Christian Danner, Christmas dinner as we used to call him, and Peter Obendorfer. They raced that car in period in 1981. Wow. And they're back to do it again. The same car, the three 30 together. 40 years later. Yeah. Uh, 40 years later. 40 years later. Yeah. Leopold looks as fit as a... The fiddle he does on. I just saw him on, on the uh, start line there. Remarkably, one of the smaller grids that we have here, although they are yeah. the uh, youngest cars we've got, um, just 83 cars here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, far more than were in the programme, actually. So we've... Um, oh, no, actually, no, that's not, it's about right. Uh, yeah. Also here, the Lancia Beta, Lancia Beta Monte Carlo. This is... Uh, a little 1.4 litre turbo, Group 5 car, which allowed uh, quite uh, significant evolutions, evos of cars, including the RX-7, obviously the 911. Um, came eighth overall in 1981 with just 1.4, but of course, you, there was, it used to be 1.5, didn't it? The, the um, multiplier for turbo engines early yes. on. Uh, yes. Um, so that was, you know, you, you, you got it in uh, into the class because of that. And even though it was a small engine, it was producing a lot of power. Early days still, relatively, of, of turbocharging in race cars. I think a lot of fans will like the, the Mirage, um, raced in period by Jackie Ickes and Derek Bell, the GR8 version designed by Len Bailey, uh, and finished four, fourth in this uh, Le Mans 24 hours in 1972. And I think they'll like the look of the Vorsteiner gold livery Tosh. No real success here, except in this event. Uh, won it in uh, 2018, and uh, last year won a race, but then faltered. This race was won last year by Ludovic Carroll in the Chevron BDG. Just a quick word uh, of thanks to everyone at Peter Auto, uh, Nicola who, and his team, who have been coordinating our work etc. this weekend, as always to the responsible adult, Eve Hewitt, omnipresent as ever, and our production team here in our Bijou TV compound, uh, Manu, uh, Natasha, and the rest of the production team, particularly Olivia, who's been in the truck all the weekend, cutting the pictures that are going to the world feed. To our camera operators, both the RF guys in the pits and the paddock, uh, and those out on post, who've had pretty much everything to put up with. Rain, hot weather, chilly, chilly uh, conditions as well. It's been brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Just thought we'd get that in before we move uh, to our final race. Absolutely. And, and we've got a great location actually in this booth because we can just pop out to the uh, area where the cars are marshaled up and have a quick word with people. It does help so much to fill in the full picture, which uh, I hope we've brought you uh, this weekend. So, you know, the behind-the-scenes stories. John, you mentioned uh, liveries and that on BMW 3, the CSLs, or Batmobiles, as they were called there. UFO, another one of those I'd forgotten about, the red and white stripes there. Uh, I'm, I'm going to offer an, another car that might rival uh, that blank canvas of colours and paints and system liveries you could have on that. It's another BMW. Uh, just behind the one I've just seen uh, coming down the Mulsanne Street on the formation lap is the BMW M1. That's a car that equally looked uh, extraordinary in 
uh, all sorts of liveries. A mid-engine version, of course, and this was a this was a series that was called BMW Pro Car, uh, which ran alongside some of the Grand Prix, as you do now, rather with rather like Porsche Super Cup. Uh, they run at some of the selected Grand Prix events. They BMW did exactly the same back in 1978. And who who won the championship? None less than the reigning world champion, uh, one uh, Nicholas von Lauda. Yeah, but they nearly all had Grand Prix drivers in those cars. Oh, yeah. Absolutely fantastic series it was. In the days when you could have a Grand Prix driver racing another car at the same event, and it didn't matter. In fact, it was encouraged. It sold tickets, it brought crowd in, it was brilliant, as it should be. Bring it back, please. So our safety car lights are out. And our pole position car is the lower T286 of Maxime Gunnar on just going out of sight of my view to coming behind the safety car. Is, it, is that the pole of the car? Is it the car on the inside? It's not Patrice Lafarge. My, ap my apologies, you're absolutely right. On pole. I'm forgetting the other way round. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely right. right. I was That's just wanting to make right. sure that on the last race you were absolutely with it, John. I should have known yeah. better. Ah, uh, yes. And we I'll, I'll get my coat and be gone. That's <laughs> another T282 from 1974 and another uh, three litre V8. What's the origin of that three litre V8 then? Where did that come from? Oh, it's Cosworth DFD. It's, it's the, so it's in the DFD. Um, yeah. but we've got a big contingent, of course, from EDEC. EDEC Racing here. Nick mm -hmm. Manassian, the team manager, is in one of the cars. He was third in the, in the race last night. And, Quick, Fark, and father and son, Patrice and Paul Lafargue. Uh, Patrice in a slightly older Lola than his son, but in the first race yesterday, beat him. So Maxine Gounet was the. Um, the winner of the first race. Did, did I just did I just see a Gran Torino in there somewhere? You did. I did not. It was not on the entry list. No, it it isn't on the entry list. I I, I was confused there for a moment. We'll get to that in a moment yeah. with the Starsky and Hutch vibe. You won't miss it. Stand by for action at just after half past three on Sunday afternoon. It's the final plateau race of 2023. 43 minutes on the clock. And the cars from 1972 to 1981 rather raggedly come to the line, but get the green flags and the green lights. And Patrice Lafarge jumps away with Grinac coming up alongside of a decent start. Actually, in the end, they kind of brought it back together. 55 and 50 then going into the Dunlop chicane for the first time. Let's make sure everyone behind them goes through. There goes the Sunoco car. Behind them, one of the 935s coming through as well. That was the K3 car, the Detrian Le Monde machine. And the Duby Van Allee car going through as well. Oh, mistake going wide there into the Forest S's for the number 50. That's the T286 from 1976. That's the Gunier car that started at the front, and that's going to drop it at least to a, a position or two. On to the first part of the Mulsanne straight. And the Warsteiner Gold car leads from Nick Manassian in second in the number 68 car. Then it's the Gunet car. Another little gap back to the 18 Chevron B26, the Fletcher car. And those cars are spreading out. Manassian pushing along in the uh, number... Uh, number 68. And Hugh McKay was up in the second for a moment there in the Tate Lyle sponsored De Cardenay. I think Gunat's gone back through. Yes, he has as they come out of the Daytona chicane. And there is a Ford Gran Torino. I am not, I am not mistaking that. Not on the original entry list. Um, got a yellow flag already, John, at Marshall Post 3. So that's, uh, that's Dunlop Curve. It is it's indeed. Not, yeah. It is indeed. So it won't affect them until they get to that point. Uh, Alistair McKay having a, having a great run in that little decadenay from 1977. Well, it's a very competitive car, you know, and it's been... I know Chris Fox spent many years working, I think, as a production manager at Lola Cars, done a, would have done a great job on that. What was it, third or fourth overall in 77? It was a very a very yeah, high I, finisher, wasn't it? Yeah. Decadenay? Yeah, we need to check that. I think, I I think, think fourth. it was fourth. I think it didn't yeah. quite make the podium. Uh, and I, my eyes did not deceive me. A 1976 <laughs> Ford Gran Torino. You're, Jacks you're drawn Al to that, aren't you? Yeah. Alvagnas, uh, the number 41 car, is leading his GTS 27 C class. Look, it's square, it's big, it's boxy, and it's got a V8. What's not to like? 
quite honestly. It's very efficient as well. It's trading a BMW M1. Deja vu from Jensen Butler Owl and Jimmy yeah, Johnson absolutely. three weeks ago. Yeah. Same deal. Rocky, Mike Rockefeller as yeah, well. Rocky as well, yeah. Well, it's a big lead for the Varsteiner, uh, for the Varsteiner Lola T292. Patrice Lafarge knows his way around here very well. In, oh, big off. Oh, oh that, that's that is Chris the McAllister. Five. That's a mirage that finished fourth overall here. Yeah, M M M6 Mitchell, Chris McAllister. 1972, 3-litre V6. Now, that might bring out a safety car. Depends whether they can move that easily. So, any passes need to be made right now. The Decadene of Humicate is breaking. Oh, he just lost it coming through the left-handed kink on the way down to Indianapolis Arnage. That's uh, halfway down the run from Mulsanne to Indianapolis. Slow zone in zone one as well, so something's happened at the start of the lap. And safety car, right, safety yeah. car is out. I thought it would be. What a shame. Wow. So the pass that Hugh McCaig just made on the number 50, Lola, because Gunnar had dragged by, McCaig used the more nimble Decadene from 77 to just get by under brake and he's gone back through to second. Now that Decadene, I've just checked up, the, it was with, raced with Chris Kraft at the time and Correct. finished fifth overall fifth. at Le Mans. Sorry. And it was, the, but the year before, uh, with the same lineup, it finished third overall. Yeah, well, that, not, I, knew, I knew they'd got one pony out of it, and that uh, Alan de Cadenay sad, sadly missed, and it was a year ago today that he passed away. Yeah, I went to his memorial service. It's the most incredible memorial service I've ever been. Sir Anthony Bamford gave the main eulogy. It was just an unbelievable day. Much missed to Cad uh, at any function. I spent a very happy afternoon yeah. right here at Le Mans when he was flying a... Uh, steam and biplane back to the UK, realised it was Le Mans weekend, so dropped in, literally, found his way at the studio somehow, <laughs> in the way that only Alain could. And we sat all afternoon talking about the old days, no playing of records, nothing else. And in fact, we barred the door so that none of the production <laughs> staff could get in and stop us talking. And uh, he stayed overnight and then flew out in the morning. Now, is that the uh, number 29 T290, T292 uh, Lola of Tony Sinclair? I just saw being pulled behind the barrier yeah, there. Yeah, shame. Tony goes well in that car. The first three cars have all got Cosmo DFE engines in. They're all three-litre cars. Then we got the 935, and then we got Nick Manasson. He's in a two-litre car, So and so is Henry Fletcher. Well, yeah. he's called Quick Nick for a, a very good reason, yeah. not just that it rhymes. Uh, he is <laughs> he, He's earned that title. In his own way, and the most uh, lugubrious, laconic Frenchman you could ever wish to meet, and such, such a nice chap. I, Frenchman lived for years in Brighton, I think, uh, with his wife Jane. He was certainly that I, way. I, he moved back during COVID, I know. Yeah, back to, back well, and of course, he's, he's got a big job with Ebeck now. Le, uh, Ebeck, yeah. Ebeck, I, I mean, Ebeck, actually. Ebeck, yeah. 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 Ebeck was a, a car similar to the, the Cadenay, actually, that was hopefully going to be here. Uh, but didn't get its papers in time. But uh, another similar Cosmos pad car built by a wild eccentric called Ian Bracy. So, top of the shop then, the mm. Taj from 1976, behind the safety car. The, yeah. the pit lane window opens in just under nine minutes' time. Now, is this good news or bad news for the leaders in the class? Mm. They can't be caught, but they can't pull Front away. Front right either. puncher for 67. That's uh, that's not good news, John. He's got to bring that into the pits. Safety car pit window open or not. Yeah. Uh, he's got the age-old problem, though, getting that car back without uh, damage. That carcass is uh, is pretty uh, pretty ripped on that. That's the 67. That's Hans-Jörg Hübner yeah. from Germany. Three-litre flat six Porsche 9345 from 1976. The, there are some really interesting cars in this. Apart, apart from that, uh, <laughs> apart from that Gran Torino, we've got the Cheetah G602 uh, out there. We've mentioned the Mirage. Uh, we've got Claudia Halkin, one of the best-known lady racers, 
over years, race trucks, all sorts of things. She's in a, a BMW 2002 Group 2 car, Heidegger prepared Lovely. car, from uh, 1975. Another retirement, the 48 uh, 924 Carrera GTR Porsche from 1981. So in the last year of this uh, uh, validity for this category, this plateau, that's uh, pierre Arnaud de Lachier, Eric Bruton and Benjamin de Fortis, uh, that car driven by, but no longer, unfortunately, it's retired to the pits and uh, they've, they've shut the bonnet on it very quietly and just, uh, as, you say, as you would say, John, you do that similar when the shutter comes down. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 240 Z Datsun is leading its class. That's, that's the Chris Craft car I mentioned, uh, John, the 29, which is now being the, uh, the Datsun, oh, oh, sorry, okay, yeah. sorry. The uh, Datsun 240Z that I was just talking about there, Group 4 from 1972, Michael, uh, Michel Gilles leading its class. What do we know about the Moine and the Tecma? Those two, those are uh, Moine uh, LM75 and a Tecma PH755. The Moine looked a bit of a copy of a Ligier, really, mm. as far as I could tell. Um, to, uh, and, the tec uh, and the Tecma? But both are just little footnotes of history that cars that race vaguely at Le Mans, you know, I'm not sure that either actually qualified. Um, but, uh, you know, optimistic Frenchmen who thought they could do something. And uh, talking of manufacturing, I mean, not many people will know what a Toj is. And they were much better known for their Formula 2 and Formula 3 cars that they built, uh, Jörg Obermoser. And they built two or three sports cars towards the end of their um, construction career. Uh, but their cars went quite well in the European Formula 2 championship. They, they knew what they were doing, did, did uh, Toj. The the Inalterio mentioned earlier, yeah. that was actually a, a sponsor name, wasn't it? It's a Rondeau. For Jean Rondeau's yeah. And car. Vic Elford team managed it. And the sponsor is the wallpaper and paint manufacturer. Ah. Mm. And Rondeau's still, I think, the only, and probably will always be, um, the only um, uh, driver and constructor to win the 24 Hours of Le Mans. I, th I think the first people to win were the Cosworth DFE as well. Oh, uh, really? I think so. Wow, that's another feather. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they did a good job, Jean Rondeau. And again, Miss... Uh, do, do, I, do I get the feeling, though, he hasn't had quite the... Um, uh, the recognition for that? You know, we talk about the French heroes at this race, and, and do we talk about Rondeau enough? I'm not sure we do. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, an incredible achievement. I think they're from Le Mans as well, aren't they? Yeah, they are. They're a Le Mans based company. So they are Satois' company. Amazing. The one in 1980, didn't he? Mm. Um, so. I, 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 I didn't know this. He died at the age of 39. Yes. Yes. I can't remember the, the In this class, of course, uh, as always, Porsches. Porsche. Um, since 1951, uh, when it uh, ended and won the 1100cc class, uh, two Frenchmen, Voyer and Mouche, won there, 356. Uh, no edition of the race has taken place without a Porsche being on the grid. It's the longest unbroken, unbroken streak. Just finish that Jean Du, Jean Rondu story. Absolute tragedy. He was killed on a level crossing, hit by a train. Right. Absolutely right. Following a police car. Yeah. I was going to say, but apparently the story was he yeah, was a little, little bit of a, a bit of a devil maker, wasn't he? Sort of yeah. cha chased, chased the eternal second, if you like, and uh, apparently was trying to get through the level crossing before the barriers came down, uh, and was unsuccessful. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, terminally so. But the Matra in here as well. Three successive victories for the. Fantastic sounding yeah. 670, the V12 three litre machine. Oh, well, they need to look at the screen, John. You've got uh, your magnificent NASCAR. There it is, going pretty well, I think. Well, what is the. I need to know the origin of that car because that. It, it looks more like. A, uh, is it a Grand National car? Maybe. Yeah. Um, looks like an SCCA car to me. It, 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 yeah, it doesn't look like a quote-unquote stock car, although they were a little different back in in that era. It's a 1976 vintage car coming through the Ford chicane appropriate. Now, it's a big old thing in front of a BMW M1, so it's clearly not too shoddy. Got the extra lights on for the overnight machine, uh, the overnight running. Pit window opens in two minutes. 
now. No, I'm at three minutes. Safety car is out, so we are neutralised. This will be frustrating for the drivers. We've lost already about 10 minutes of this for that incident being cleaned up with gusto and professionalism by our marshals, who are doing a great job, as ever this weekend. Don't know what happened to the two Lafargues, father and son, who are very competitive in the uh, opening two races in this plateau, and then the... Oh, yeah, safety car. The, the, the cleanup is complete, by the way. Just should know that, so we should get the safety car in at the end of, of this lap. Anyway, Lafargue's definitely not part of it now. It's all about Yves Shamama, the uh, Cincinnati-based Swiss racer. Alistair McCaig and uh, Max Gunay, who uh, runs an outfit called Equip Europe, run a lot of uh, cars of this ilk. But big name in uh, racing over here, in historic racing, but, but not really known outside of the pond. But uh, raced successfully and won in a Porsche 935 uh, in the past and various other cars. Carlos Tavares has moved up. Uh, he's leading his class in the Chevron P21, the 1972 two-litre car. If you recognise that name, mm -hmm. um, nothing to do with the pop group, everything to do with, depending on how you uh, measure it, the first or second largest car conglomerate in the world, Stellantis. And he's been doing quite a lot of racing recently. Uh, done a couple of Nürburgring 24 hours with some of his fellow, fellow executives. Uh, he was... Uh, he moved up to a full TCR car in, in the race this year, although they didn't get the rub of the green. And he's also been doing a little uh, racing in Kreventnik as well. And uh, making, well, enjoying it. And, you know, much like we mentioned Jim Farley from Ford earlier on. Yeah. How good do you feel as a car person that the people, you know, a couple of people at the top of two of the biggest names of brands in the car world are out there racing. They're, they've got a gear stick in their hand and petrol running through their veins, Peter. It's the only place to be, isn't it? Yeah. In a race car, wherever. If it's somewhere like Le Mans in these conditions with another, not 10, 20, 30 cars around you, but 80 plus, I mean, that's even, even better. I just, I just love it, just love it. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, Andy Palmer from Aston Martin, when he was le uh, leading Aston Martin, he raced a lot. I was teammate to him once and uh, happy birthday to Andy. Yes, I celebrated his 60th year today, si wasn't it? Uh, significant birthday. Sorry. Um, I mispronounced weekend. it, sorry. Yes. I'll put my teeth back in. I know he'll be watching this. It's only because he posted it on, on, on social media that I knew what it was, which which one it was, but my apologies. Andy, Slip of the tongue. best wishes to you. Uh, steadfastly refuses to retire, doing a lot of consultancy work. Into the pit lane. Way too young to retire. 44 BMW 3 litre CSL. This is the Gerard Lecheur with Benjamin Munch and Xavier Lecheur as well. As you might imagine, that straight six three litre is an all French crude machine. We weren't far away from getting back to green at the start of this lap, but we will be going back to green at the end of it. There's a little bit of the uh, preparation on the circuit that soaks up all the fluids but other than that I think we'll be fine the pit window is still 14 minutes away from closing now what do you do now I reckon if you're not right at the very front I'd pit right now yes absolutely whilst absolutely. everybody is close together they'll every, be tripping over each other as Alan Manish would say every competitive advantage possible cue Peter Mackay yes <laughs> um, I know you're listening Peter he'll be watching all of this Making notes on uh, p -Mark. Listening. I've, uh, yeah. I've put down the Moine. I put it uh, down, I said it was a... Yeah, a footnote a, to history, you said, I, Andrew. I, I think you'll find. In 1970, before the court. In 1975, um, the Moine LM75 won the two-litre prototype class here, driven by three ladies, Michel Mouton, no less, great uh, rally driver, Marianne Hopfner and Christian Decremont. So it has got a history. Fully deserves to be here. I have to say, it does look a lot like a, a, a Ligier. Um, and Andre Moynet was the man behind it. So, uh, Michelle Mouton there you are. should have won the World Rally Championship as well. Yeah. Andrew Marriott live, redefining history. Yeah. Well, 
I was just, I knew him. he'd look it up. I go, yeah, I, 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 it was bu it's begging me, bu bugging, bugging me, you. Yeah. because I they did. They were begging. It was one of the things I Googled earlier in the week, and then I, for some reason, didn't make the note. Right, oh, here they come. Into the pits. Now, the, some of the leaders are coming in. So, from second, Hugh McKaig from third. The going out to uh, Lola coming in, also coming in. The Porsche 935, the Dubli Van Allee car. That's the number 46. As we go back to green. No, the Nassian stayed out. Now that's, sure. that's, yeah. a good, that's a good barometer for me. Yeah, Shamama what stayed Nassian out. Does. Yeah. Yeah. The first two stayed out. The number 18, Lawler, stayed out as well. That's the, uh, the Fletcher and Henry Fletcher. Martin O'Connell car. Yeah, he's, he's, he's racing following in the footsteps of his dad, who uh, also was hugely successful in Chevrons. So, Andrew Fletcher. So, here's the thing now, those of you who are watching. You need, if you are steering out, you've got a clear track. You have got to make the best of the clear track right now, because this is your opportunity to hold on to the position that you've got rather than lose it. The guys in the pit lane have got to get that pit stop and the driver change and their timing absolutely spot on. And then they've got to drive super quick on their out lap to try and beat these guys. I think these guys will do one lap and come straight back in. What they won't want to do is catch any traffic and therefore slow themselves down. So at the front of the field, the Shimama Todge, the number 17 car, leads the race and its class. The top five are all class leaders. Nick Manassian in the Lola T298 from 79, the 68 car. Then the Chevron Breeze 26 we've been talking about, that's the 18. The first of the saloon cars, if you will, the BMW 3-litre CSL. That's the Halusa's car again. Uh, that's the number 16 car. And then the Group 4 uh, Porsche number 60 and that car's come up from well down on the starting grid so that had even before everything went sideways literally and the safety car had to come out uh, that's a class leader as well then the first of the pro cars that's the christian uh, no it's not the christian glazer car because that's just glazer and he's got an umlaut uh, on his name that is in the fifth, sixth, seventh position. And the Ferrari 512 BBLM is out, stayed out as well. That's the 26 car. That is gorgeous. Uh, Joe Bradley would be uh, salivating over that, that car. That's the Hackler car. Right, the pit stops have been done. Everybody peels out of the pits. I think it was the 935 that got out first. The number 46, the Doobie Van Allee car. Then it was the Lawler in second, the number 50. Uh, oh, hang on, 19, 27, 39, and 41 uh, reported. No, that's all right. So now it's about this outlet. But, and, and this is oh. the thing, Peter, if you've changed drivers in particular, you now, as the incoming driver, there's no time to settle yourself in. You can't just be having a chat by the water cooler flat out now from the off. Yeah, just uh, just saying, just very quickly, we've got the, the Robin Hamilton uh, Aston Martin from 1977 uh, edition of this race uh, on track now. Uh, I forgot to say when the car was recommissioned and put back to ready to come here at, uh, at uh, Le Mans Classic, who was requested and did the original shakedown for it, the initial shakedown? You. No, Robin Hamilton. Oh, Robin, oh, oh I Robin thought Hamilton. you had. Did you race that car? Or, uh, no, no, uh, no. A sister car. A sister car. Yeah. One of the uh, about to lose uh, position here. Uh, to the number seven, which is the in Altera, the Rondo, as we were mentioning with the three litre car, three litre V8 car. One of the things about that car, and it was funny, I was talking about this, but believe it or not, with another British Mark Bentley. That car, because of the regulations, as the leaders are coming into the pits at the end of this lap, as we expected, so we've got about a minute and a half to make this point before we see if the lead changes. The regulations allowed you to extend the bodywork of that car, what they, it, which is exactly what they did. But it looks a bit weird from the front, Peter, because the headlights are on their original position. And therefore, the, um, the profile of the car and 
the position of the headlights relative to the outside of the car has changed. Uh, and it, it looks a bit, a little bit weird. It's almost when, an optical illusion, isn't yes, it? Yes, that's right. When Bentley did their GT3 uh, Continental GTC car, um, they, you were allowed to do the same thing. You were allowed to widen the car. Bentley used their own designers to make a new front panel to move the headlights to put them back in proportion with where the outside of the car would be. So you look at that and you don't realise it's as wide as it is and the, the face, if you will, of the car actually retains the proportions, which the Aston is a perfect example of it not doing that. You weren't yeah. allowed to do that in those days. I'm not seeing no, it. No, rules restrict yes, it, but exactly. all the same, it makes it look slightly, if you like, ungainly. Yes, it's it. probably a kind way of putting it. Uh, it makes but, it look damn wide. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but yeah, it, it's how it presents, isn't it? Perception is everything. Yes, perception is reality. Seven minutes still to go on the pits. So we've yeah. got to wait now to see. Now, the Warsteiner car is moving. This is the number 17, the Shimama car, out of the pit lane, uh, driving solo. Where are the cars that pitted the last time around? Answer, they mm. are not in sight and off. For the number 35, this That's is the Moine. lovely Moyne, the class winner. The Michelle Mouton driven in period class winner. And did no. that get a bit of help here? Uh, through the second chicane, just maybe spinning up or onto the dirty part of the track. Ah, uh, no, there's well, a failure. A mechanical failure isn't is it? there yeah. a problem with the left rear? It does seem to be sitting slightly down there. So it have hasn't we, hit the wall. Have we not got uh, Richard Meal taking over the uh, Yves Schmarmer? No. He's not driving it? Don't think so. No, OK. I know he's down in the entry list to do no, it. Talk doesn't normally. Make sure. No, uh, thought not. So, 19, 27, 39, 41. None of those are there. So, through into second, but yet to stop. Uh, those who are proponents of the Blue Oval, a little cheer for the RS2600, for number 37. Uh, well, a big cheer for that car, because I think it's come all the way from Australia. Uh, is it...? Uh, uh, yes. Roger Townsend, apologies, all the way from New Zealand. New Zealand, yes, I was yeah, from Christ, to we got. Spoke to him yesterday, he's from Christchurch, New Zealand. So he's just looking for a class win here. What a magnificent effort to fly a car like this. He's raced a lot uh, down under. The 2.6... RS often thought of as a better car than the 3.1. Uh, again, regulations uh, with that 2.6 engine um, and absolutely quality looking piece of kit. Not quite as uh, perhaps as extreme as some of the later cars. Uh, smaller, in fact, no race spoiler on that car, if I remember rightly. It's a little flick up on that car. The Mark II rear lights. The 81 Porsche, heading back towards the pits at the moment, is a Carrera RSR from 1974. And this is Frederick and Guido Di Eguido, uh, who are listed as French and Italian, although yeah. from the same family. Uh, beautiful, beautiful livery on that car, like that. Here's a, the typical BMW Pro Car colours, the beer, famous BMW red. Motorsports so, vibe. Yeah. Now, which one of the cars is that? It's, there's a group of three going down the first part of the Mulsanne straight, passing the bright yellow Porsche, but I don't think that's in the same fight. Number 26 is the car that leads that pair, and that is the Ferrari 512 BBLM from 1981, the Roland Hechler car. Bit, bit of four. And he's been... Can't. Closed in on, sorry. Bit of an Aston connection for you with the Ferrari, because Mike Salmon raced that car in period here. Indeed, as did uh, with uh, Simon Phillips. Yeah, Simon Phillips was in the car, and uh, trying to remember who the, the third driver was. Uh, Steve Earle, the American. Steve Earle, yes. Yeah, they yeah. were the trio. And they are closing down on the Capri. One of the Capris. There is more. There are more than one. In turn, being closed down on by an M1 very that, rapidly. And it wasn't just that eternal piece of elastic at the chicane. No, that uh, is I think the, the M1's going to. Uh, uh, I think it's going to challenge that Ferrari in a minute, John. That's the number six car for Michael and Peter uh, Hinderer. 
Shall we make it now, shall we? Let's yeah. go around the outside of it to come out of the chicane. I mean, fantastic concept, that BMW M1. Um, there was a Formula One support series that the featured car. these cars, yeah. a pro car, and this is where these cars have come from. Often see them in the Nürburgring young timer race but it was it, as andrew said it wasn't just a just a, a formula one support no, race. No. it was driven by the formula one drivers. correct of course uh, of course the one of the best racing drivers in the world ever nicky lauda won that series yep. in 78 and um i did you look at it interesting no i did not launch it you sure uh, is it just one you've forgotten but no the car was prepared by dick bennett's ah Another Kiwi Never convention. heard of him there. Exactly. Another Kiwi He's convention. He's had very tough. West Surrey Racing so, Touring Cars. So imagine those cars around Formula One circuits on a Formula One weekend with the Formula One drivers, the majority of them, in fact, all of them at one stage, um, racing in that for money. Basically, yes. there was a cash prize. Um, that wasn't the only manufacturer who did that, and one of the most bizarre ones I've ever seen. And, uh, and there is, if you look on the internet and find it. I promise you, you'll have a good chance of finding this. There's footage of a Peugeot 505 GTI Grand Prix support with Grand Prix drivers around Monaco. Oh, I, I around Monaco. Why wouldn't you, though? Yeah. Vanina X in the 65 BMW. She was, uh, I think, starting the race, and I don't think that car's come into the pits uh, yet. And she was... Burned uh, Georgi and Adrianus van Hoydonk. Burned from Germany, Adrianus from the Netherlands. John, up front we've got the three DFB powered cars: Shamama yeah. in the Toys, Gunnar in the uh, Gunnar in the uh, Lola, and then uh, McCaig in the Decadene. About ten seconds between Shamama, who won this event in 08, in, uh, 18, I should say. Gunnar second, McCaig though only a second and a half behind uh, Gunnar. Uh, and the top, what, five, six, down to Nick Manassian. Within 19 seconds, Manassian's just put the fastest, fastest first sector in of anybody. Now, was Manassian going to jump out of that car? At the uh, no, I don't think, no. That was the, all the IDEC people were staying in their cars. Right. The two Lafargues having hit problems, sadly, having run strongly earlier on. Oh, no, no, yes, the one, the 57, that one is. Now, is that father or the son? We need to check that out. Second in class at yeah. about tenth overall. That's the sun. That's the sun, Paul. And uh, of course, just outside. Uh, the IDEX sponsor all sorts of other things other than motor racing, don't they? But they're, they're the people who have got this Del Delage connection, trying to bring Delage back into uh, the racing. So the Taj, resplendent in its gold livery, gold making a bit of a comeback at Le Mans this year with yeah. Hertz Racing yeah. Gold for Jota and uh, the Nielsen Racing, Corby's finest racing team, um, my local team. Look, Sven and the rest of the lads and lasses there, both running in gold colours to celebrate in, in uh, Nielsen's case, the 100th anniversary. Yep. Hertz, uh, Hertz team, Jota uh, racing, racing Green, that's your local team. Forstein, a big German brewery, big supporters of motor racing in the 80s, sponsor of the Arrows team for you. We remember seeing Ricardo Patrese racing these colours, sponsored a lot of cars actually. But one of the bigger breweries in Germany. So into the last dozen minutes now in this open top car. In some ways, actually, well ahead of its time when you think of the uh, how exposed the drivers used to be in this era, and here's a car that the cockpit sides are actually quite high, and you can't see the driver's shoulders. And in fact, at the head, uh, where the head of the driver is, you can barely see his helmet. And uh, that certainly didn't used to be the case. Just gone past and put a lap on the number 45 BMW 2002 Heidegger car. It's one of the Group 2 cars from 1975 for Claudia Hurtgen, uh, Angelo Di Casa and uh, Manuelo Di Casa. Di Casa has been driving that car as well. Down through the gearbox, healing and towing. So basically pushing the brake with one part of your right foot and then blipping the throttle 
with the other, with the outside of your foot, and you do that to match the revs and therefore the speed of the different cogs in the gearbox. All done automatically for you nowadays, you get auto blip, but even on cars that have got it, I turn mine off. The paddle shift now, what it just does it automatically, just go left is down, right is up, that's what it is. It's matching the uh, the gearbox, so the gear, Correct. gears, the, the spinning to, gears, to the road wheel to the road speed, speed. Is, is the yeah. gearbox. Uh, otherwise, you get you literally get drive line snatch into one where smooth drivers are there because you've got straight cut gears on these on these goods. You've got no synchro mesh, nothing to lead the next gear down. It's going down the gearbox is the problem because you get that overrun that you want an engine braking, and it's that's where the smooth drivers and drivers that can perfect that art will just stand out uh, in the wet conditions because the one thing you don't want to do is lock the rear wheels uh, in the wet. Uh, the 17 has just dropped down. I think that must be a must tiny be a glitch, yeah. Glitch. It's, still, it's still there, John. Uh, I believe it's still there. It's just, just gone off, off our Nat screen. Is shown as leading the 50 car, but um, from I, that Lola T286 with the outrageous uh, rear intakes uh, ahead of the rear wheels, still behind it. So that must just be a little problem, um, unless he's had a penalty unless that car's had a penalty, but they don't normally put those on until the end. So keep an eye on the timing there uh, for the Warsteiner car. It was shown at the head of the field, but now has dropped down, although still on track, I'm certain, in front of the number 50, which scored as the leader. So, there's a Gennard in the Oxford Group car, car that raced in Britain a lot in the That's past. Down at Mulsanne Corner. 19, 27 and 41 are the last cars that have been penalised, and that's not that's not the Warsteiner car. That's the 18 car. So the Tosh, which raced here in period in 1976. Um, yeah, there's a 17 car being being oh, passed. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's oh, it is now slowing. It, is, it is has now, now got slowing. a problem. So the screen was right. It wasn't a glitch. It has got an issue. What a great shame. Drama in this last plateau, John. Well, yes. <laughs> so you're it, not sold, are you? It must have lost a lap then. A whole lap. Its last lap was 4.40, which was a little bit slow, but it's not been scored through any of the first sectors of this lap, and it's already at Arnage. So something's gone, something's gone wrong with the timing, with its timing transponder in the early part of the lap, and it's not being scored. Now, I accept that it's going slowly, but the 50 car was definitely behind it going into the Daytona chicane. It has now passed it. In the first race uh, yesterday, ah. it lost its brakes. It had brake problem and, and retired. See, now we've got the split times coming up. So 93 seconds in the first was fine. That was quicker than kind second. It's showing 116. Well, it's showing us doing the last, the fastest lap of the race last time around. I, I'm bemused by this. Uh, however, see when they come through this time to complete the seventh lap and where it actually is in relation to the number 50. Because it, it's done its pit stop and it's now dropped off the first page. So waiting for the leader to come through. Now, there it goes. So something very odd has happened there with the Taj. Do you think it's maybe had the brake problem again? Possibly. Well, there was something odd with the timing before that. Yeah, no, I realise that, but there seems to be two issues going on here. It is now slowing, it has now slowed, and, and by eye, it has been passed. So now we've got the battle between uh, Hugh McCaig and the Decadenay, and Manassian, along with the Vanillet car, right there as well. So this is the number three Decadeneer, the dark blue car, 
And in fact, that's already changed, has it? Yes, yeah, it has. Three car battle for second place, isn't it? Terrific stuff. And Hugh McCaig's lost one place. He's about to lose, lose another one to the Porsche. The 935, number 46. This is the white and green car going through. And that Lawler does not look, uh, that Decadene, excuse me, does not look to be up to speed. So the red car of Nick Manassian now in second and pulling away. We've got a problem for car number 44, which is well down the field. So let's leave that on one side at the moment. Gap going out between Gane and Manassian from five and a half to six and a half seconds. Now back down again to 5.6. Uh, great to see Nick Manassian up there uh, on effectively a podium position. Yeah, let's not forget he's got two litres and uh, Gune has got three litres of course with DFE in the back of that uh, Lola 286. Yeah, see? but the 298's got Nick Manassian in it. No, dis no disrespect yeah, to Gune. Makes a, yeah, a litre extra. He more than makes up for a litre. Does, does one Manassian make up for one litre of capacity? Easily. In this Easily. In the pit lane for the red and white number 40, the Tecmo, Tecma PH755, 1800cc, Donny Lequier, three wide, going into ah. the kink, and our Nick Manassian driven bright red Lola heading down to uh, to a Mulsan corner, sorry. Um, too busy trying to watch what's going in the pit lane at the same time. The gap is seven seconds. Nick took a second out of the leader last time around. He's taken seven tenths, eight tenths already in this lap. Time is running out with just four minutes to go. The next lap, I think, will be the last lap. Yes, it will. So Nick's got a lap and a half to make up 6.7 seconds. I'll not be bothered about that, Nick. He'll just cruise home to the finish. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Said no one ever. <laughs> this, this Lola, um, you still see the sponsorship on it from the Otford Group. It, this didn't race internationally. This was a car that raced in Thunder Sports uh, back in the day, uh, driven by a guy called James Wallace. This is the 50 car, is it? This is, a, this is a 50 car, yes. Yeah. It's, it's not a sort of big international car. It's certainly going very well here, isn't it? Well, it seems to be and I think a, 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 a shout out too um, for the Osborne Ward British combination, best of the pro cars there. Um, Joe Osborne and um, racing there. And that's the end, not giving up and continuing to push. He, oh, he's got the leader in sight here. Yeah. That's about five seconds now. Yeah, 4.997. Can't get more accurate than that, John. Sorry, I'd forgot to look at the screen. <laughs> I was actually counting yeah. in my head. If you'd seen me, I was doing this with my fingers. Well, it's still accurate. It works. Uh, so, the abacus of the hand. Slightly different uh, rear wing treatment on the two. Cars battling for the Make lead. Make that 3.9 across the line. Yeah, this is getting this is getting interesting now. Oh, oh, this, this is doable for Manassi and the Vanille to be to be uh, Porsche now into third. Another four seconds further back. So the Oxford Group number 50. Oh, Oxford. 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 Yeah. Group number 50 underneath the Dunlop Bridge, much lower rear wing on the 76 car to the 79. Something almost a, a longer tail to it. So different aerodynamics in the sides. The huge knacker ducks on the inside of the car to the back wheels. Much more prominent on the white car than they are on the red livery of Manassian's car. Traffic could play a part here. And where's the Manassian there? He is going out of Turt Rouge. He can see the car. There's one Porsche between them. It's down to two and a half seconds. This is not over. We've still got the better part of six miles. And for our last televised race of this weekend, Nick Manassian has made a race of He's got to go down the inside here. Got yeah. to make the pass, and he does. Had to do that there. You could see him, almost see the 
the contouring in the Manassian head there. Do I do this? Has he seen me? Am I going to write the car off? Yeah. Oh, willing, yeah. willing to that force your drivers. Yeah. Look in your mirrors. Look in your mirror because I'm, I'm came, coming ready or not. Came close to winning Lamar several times. He had a second new rate factory driver for Persia, of course, Nick Manassian. And uh, that's cost him a full second there. And the ah, there's the Taj. Yeah. Didn't make it all the way back to the substantive part of the pit lane. So Manassian's got to do it again. The gap's gone out to 3.7 seconds. He lost out in the traffic there. Now, can he make it back? Looks just like a little, little flick of opposite lock as he came out. Just got on the power, just caught it. Typical, I did say at the beginning, he's not called quit, Nick, because it rhymes. Uh, it, it, it does look as though they're slightly more trimmed out. He might not have the pace through the place of the, uh, the Porsche curves. Manassian, two wheels right to the edge of the dotted line, coming into that right kink before Mulsan. He's got one car between himself and the leader is there. Start the run back from the furthest part of the track. Manassian getting a little bit of a tour from one of the other prototypes and will pop out to the right-hand side. I tell you what, he's got good here, worried. He's looking in his mirrors. He's looking in his mirrors and Manassian's through. The bright red number 68 Lola. It's the battles. Battle of the Lolas. Down towards Indianapolis for the final time. The lead is 4.8 seconds, so it's gone out. Wow. Yeah, three litres versus two litres. Oh, and Nick really showing all his skill as a pro driver against someone who is a, a more an engineer, really. But uh, what a phenomenal drive from Manassian, showing he's still got the talent. That, that little lift that he had to have for the Porsche just killed his speed through the Daytona chicane, the first chicane on the Mulsan straight. That might have just killed the opportunity, but he's coming into the Porsche curves now. The lead has got traffic, but I'm not sure it's going to be enough. Manassian comes in with a clear run to the first part of the Porsche curves, waits, 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 turns in at the last possible moment and takes much momentum through Porsche curves one. Now it's left and then right. Oh, huge amount of traffic for the leader here. And the offer group car, mostly white, in behind Porsches. There's another Ford Capri there as well. I think, yes, there is. But Manassian's not close enough. I don't think he's going to get there. Manassian coming through the Corvette curve now, but it will be the Maxim Gunat driven Lola T286 from 1976 with the DFV to take our final plateau race of the weekend. The gap is going to be about three seconds at the end as Manassian was trying everything there, but just comes up short and crosses the line now. Four seconds, in fact, and what a run for the 9.35, by the way, in third position amongst all those prototypes. Easily the best of the closed topped cars. So Maxim Gunat, wins, what does that do to the overall positions after three races? Oh, definitely good uh, wins it. A win, a second and a win, he takes it. Uh, but Nick Manassian, a fourth, and uh, I think uh, another good position. I think he'll be second overall, but uh, obviously the sums have to be done officially. Mm. So Gunnar, one, two, one in the... Uh, also, uh, that's not bad at all, is it? No. Out, of, out of three, nearly, nearly three wins. Great looking cars, great era. What a way to finish our plateau races for the weekend. Hope you've enjoyed it and been with us in sound or sound and vision. Well, what a celebration of motor racing of the last hundred years. A little bit of sad news coming to us here in the broadcast booth this afternoon and uh, not a great note to end our broadcast on but I'd like to pass our condolences on to Matt Neal and the rest of the Neal family, Steve Neal, his dad uh, unfortunately having uh, died this weekend at 82 an absolute giant of British motorsport, yeah. he would have loved this, let this stand as uh, a little bit of an honour to Steve. Great driver in his own right. In his own right he yeah. was. Team yeah. Dynamics, Dynamic yeah. Wheels. We have all had some of those on the cars and he was very good to us down through the years. Rest in peace, Steve. Condolences to the family.
Well, a worthy finish to our coverage this weekend here from the 11th Le Mans Classic. And what a way to round off the weekend. 800 cars with 11 grids in total and six, of course, the Le Mans Classic plateaus. Uh, in the end, a relatively easy win for Maxime Gunat being chased down by Nick Manassi, and of course that doesn't make it easy when you know you've got Nick closing in on you, the pressure was there. A little bit of safety car caused when the, the, we had an Chris incident McAllister, with the yeah. Chris McAllister Mirage uh, went in to the wall, and that did cause a bit of an issue. We're not sure what happened with that Varsteiner car. It was fine after the pit stops and got out in the lead, and then Maybe I'm wondering if it was maybe an electrical problem which took out the transponder or something like that and then brought the car to a halt because there was certainly something that went wrong with that car. And that gave us a fabulous look at the Lawless. Monnet going, uh, not getting to the end, a car that's won its classic period with an all female crew, including uh, Michel Mouton, former president of the FIA Women's Committee. Disrespect of stop and go procedure for 19 and 41. Just checking to make sure that doesn't affect any of the top positions. No, it does not. In fairness, it looked like the Todge Andrew had it all wrapped up and, uh, until yeah. it didn't. Uh, Manassian fighting his way through the field. Earlier in the proceedings, earlier race, it had actually it was ignition problems. Ah. Uh, I, I said it was brakes. It was the Cadenet that had the brake problems. That this car had ignition problems, and maybe that reoccurred. It left the number 50 Lola Peter with the three litre engine, uh, not exactly to cruise home. As I said, a bit of pressure from uh, Maxime Gunat, but he's taken this and will take this plateau overall as well. Well, you thought at that point he, he could cruise home, but Nick Manassian, being Nick Manassian, had very different ideas about that and uh, uh, gave it a challenge right to the very end of the very last plateau of Le Mans Classic 2023. A Frenchman chasing down for the overall win. Uh, and also, um, have to have to say as well um, a, a phenomenal weekend of racing in all of the categories this weekend and can I just say also absolutely good clean racing think of the number of cars on the grid oh. the variety the speed differentials the ability experience differentials and we've not seen anything not one single incident that's caused a problem for anybody other than just good, clean, respectful driving. Hey, even, Absolute hats off to Peter Auto. Even talking to the drivers, I think there's been a couple of um, a couple of incidents that have slightly upset the drivers, but not much more than that. Kyle Tilly came from, I think, 77th to 11th on one of his grids uh, and thoroughly enjoyed that. You can't do that without respect. Um, and, and that's the thing. So we'll take a last look at the results here. Two Lawlers winning their classes. Then the Porsche, that was a class winner. The Chevron in fourth, also a class winner. The Cadenet eventually finishing up uh, second in its class and fifth. Six for the Lawler T. 298, the Lafarge car. Di Tomoso Pantera up inside the top 10, won its class. More Lawlers taking class victories through there. The Ferrari 512 BBLM, the yellow car, not winning its class, actually. That was beaten to the punch by one of the Porsche K3s. Uh, Carrara RSR winning a class further down, the 16 BMW as well. And 320i Group 5 winning as well down at the bottom end of the top 30. Fastest lap for the number 17 car, which subsequently did not get to the end. Four minutes, 11.799. Quick lap, very quick indeed. Well, Andrew, some uh, final thoughts from you on what we've seen this weekend. Firstly, writing in the diary for two years' time. Secondly, giants of racing here, both cars and uh, people. Just absolutely loved it. It's hectic, it's hot, but it's been so much fun. Um, Peter, um, great racing, excellent organisation with some clear off to do. Absolutely brilliant. It's just the absolute go-to European event. It's been a brilliant 2023. We're back in 2025. We'll be on the odd years from now on. 
Thank you for joining us on behalf of Peter Snowden, Andrew Murray and the whole of the production crew here at Le Mans for 2023. Thank you for watching and listening. Thanks to Peter Otto and the ACO. I'm John Hindhoff. Have a good Sunday. Bye from Le Mans and Le Mans Classic 2023.